Hey, race fans, Hall of Famer Daryl Walter here. You know, it's time to drop the green flag on another edition of Meaning Right and Turning Left with Sadler and the Senator, powered by Pacematic. So, hey, pull those belts tight one more time. Here's my buddy Hermie Sadler and Senator Bill Stanley. Boogity, boogity, boogity. Let's see what they have to say, boys and girls. I'm Virginia State Senator Bill Stanley. And I'm leaning right. And I'm former NASCAR driver and Fox Sports analyst Hermie Sadler. And I'm turning left. Leaning right and turning left is back with Sadler and the Senator, powered by Pace and Adam. How are you, Hermie? Doing great, buddy. How are you? Good, good. I hate that we're not together on our, this is our 50th, 50th episode. I can't even say 50th. 5-0. 5-0. 50th episode of this year's podcast as we close out 2022. Uh, that's amazing. We've done 50 podcast with this one and uh it's been a heck of a year and i've enjoyed the heck out of it and we got renewed for next year so we're we're coming back this isn't all you get from us you get more from us so uh 50 we made 50 there Herm. what do you think of that yeah it's been a lot of fun you know so much, so much stuff happened with you and i bill in such a short period of time the podcast the race team the uh the legal battle we have going on and all the other stuff that we're navigating and balancing in our lives has been a lot. Uh, but I like you, I have enjoyed it. Some of the, you know, some of the interviews, which later today we will discuss and play back one of our best of moments of 2022 back for our listeners to hear again. But I've enjoyed having some of our friends from the world of politics, from the world of law, from the world of NASCAR, professional wrestling all things in between, but also, Bill, I've enjoyed the times when we've just sat down and, and talked about everyday normal things, you know, between us and things that go on in, in our lives and others. I think in a lot of cases, people can, you know, uh, they can relate, you know, to those kind of things that we deal with and what's going on and how we handle all that. So it's been a fun year. Uh, I appreciate pace and and everything they've done to help us have this platform to talk about all these issues that affect a lot of people and I look forward to number 50 today and certainly look forward to uh, re-racking and doing it again in 2023. Yeah, we've got 50 coming up in 2023, uh, but you're right. 2022 was an interesting year. We had so much to talk about it. We talked about whether it was skill games or lawsuits, just as you said, sports, politics, wrestling. Uh, we've had some interesting guests. Uh, what do you think your favorite moment for 2022 and all of these in the 49 episodes we've had before? What's your favorite? Well, it's just been, I mean, it's hard to, hard to pick just one, you know, and I mean that, you know, in a, in a positive way. I, I look back over the course of time, nothing will ever really take the place of the first couple we did, the, the maiden voyage, as it was <laughs> called, you know, to have my brother in those first couple of shows and had Jeff Jarrett on the first couple of shows that really kind of got us, you know, got us kicked off and, you know, and off to a good start and kind of gave us a, a shape and a model of what we could be and, you know, how the show has, has, uh, has migrated over the course of the year to, uh, to cover so many different topics, but I've had so much fun, you know, this year, I, I've got so many shows. I look back at the, you know, the, the talk about the wrestling part and, you know, we had Glenn Jacobs on the, you know, the mayor of Knox County <laughs> and dopey mayor, you know, he's also in the politics. So that's an interesting, you know, uh, twist as well. We had road dog, on and you know then i look back at uh, my racing uh friends that came on and you know phil parsons and and stefan very close to me personally and my family that was great ray evernham one of the best ever yeah you know kyle petty you know in his story to get him on the show to do that was was great as well and i've i really have enjoyed you know some of the people that you've brought in um you know people in the politics and i've learned a lot through that whole you know process of listening all that and 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 back to the law side, you and I have laughed and joked pretty much all year about Joe Camerata, you know, <laughs> and how that played out and the back and forth with all that. So, you know, this whole thing overall has been, you know, been a positive experience. It, it's it's cool for me to, when you sit down to take the time to do something like this and have fun, try to make people laugh, but but also learn. I've learned I've learned a lot from a lot of different people uh, this year about different things that. Um, that, that I need to know, quite frankly, and uh, I've enjoyed that. Yeah, and and even watching, you know, kind of your foray into politics on your own, that's been fun for me. Kind of watching you develop. You started out as an as a 
you know, a regular citizen who was standing up to government overreach and protecting small businesses and, and made you angry and it, and it was a call to action for you. And you took it from there. And I think you've not only taken it very seriously, you've shown a lot of people who listen to this podcast how everyday ordinary citizens, just like you and me, can get involved, can get passionate, and can ultimately make a difference and, and step up and say, you know what? I don't like how it's being done. I'm going to offer myself. I'm going to have the courage to stand out there and say, I want to run for public office. I want to make a difference. I want to represent you. And that, that's been fun for me. My favorite interview, I think, is you mentioned Joe Camerata. That whole exchange between the three of us, for those that haven't listened to it, it's, I think, podcast episode three or four. Joe Camerata was a co-counsel, the attorney in the Paula Jones case with me, and uh, Hermie was the ringmaster and ran us, uh, us clowns around for a while. And it was very funny talking about the funny parts of the Paula Jones versus William Jefferson Clinton case, and then seeing how different our memories were on what actually happened. I don't even think Joe Camerata believed I was there at all. But I was. And uh, that's a hilarious one. But Winsome Sears, the lieutenant governor, the his historic history-making lieutenant governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia, Winsome Earl Sears, that was an incredible that was interview that we had. And, yeah. and, and she was just, you know, she speaks her mind. She speaks very plainly, honestly, openly, and to the point. You need politicians like that, people that run for elected office that can speak in ways that not only we understand, but we get passionate behind. And and so she's been great, not only as lieutenant governor and serving as president of the Senate, where I sit uh, in the 20th Senate seat, um, she's been just an amazing uh, thing for Virginia. And, you know, it always kind of surprises me. She, when I say she's history making, she's the first African-American woman ever elected to the lieutenant governor's chair. And you would think that would, would be something to celebrate with all the, you know, Democrats who, who always make a big point about having more diversity in our politics, and, and that is important. Uh, but yet they, they don't even give her any credit whatsoever, only because she's a Republican. If she was a Democrat, they'd have her everywhere on everything. Because she's a Republican and, and speaks her mind and speaks it in a conservative way, she's discounted, disregarded by the liberals that seem to want to make that such a big, big deal. I'm, I, was, I think I sent this to you, but you know, Nancy Pelosi, when, in her last speech of the year, on the floor of the Senate when they passed that $1.7 trillion debacle continuing uh, spending resolution. You know, they care about uh, supposedly, you know, all the diversity in the world. Well, at the end, she said she wanted to wish everybody happy holidays and a happy Schwanza. She doesn't even know Kwanzaa. Yeah. And, and yet, so I always, you know, I always seem to think there's something hypocritical about Democrats when um, we all want African-Americans to be a part of, and everybody from every walk of life to be a part of, of society, to be a part of being equal in the world and, and going out there and being ambitious and fulfilling your American dream, but also being a part of politics. And then they discount anybody uh, who's a Republican who might be African-American. I mean, just like Joe Biden said, well, if you, if you ain't voting for me, you ain't black. You know, they can get away with saying that kind of stuff and discounting a winsome Earl Sears uh, just because she has a conservative viewpoint and the color of her skin uh, doesn't fit with the, what they think someone uh, who's an African-American should be thinking how they should be thinking. You know, and like you saw just this last week, there's a school taking, you know, I think it's a med school taking Dr. Ben Carson's name off of it because it offends some of the students. Because Dr. Ben Carson, a brilliant, brilliant medical doctor uh, with an incredible uh, personal history, just happens to be conservative. And so now, uh, you know, we're, we're making a big deal in Virginia about taking off uh, Robert E. Lee and all these Confederate uh, generals' names off of schools. Why are we taking off Dr. Ben Carson's? And when you listen to Winsome Sears, uh, she explains that, why it's unfortunate that Democrats just discount any African-American if they have a contrarian view from the liberal view. And it's just ridiculous. But that was it's one of my so, favorites. Yeah, it's so hypocritical what we hear. We hear so much about, you know, you can't erase, you know, history and people need to know the history, but if the history doesn't fit the right narrative for the liberals, then they're the first ones that want to erase history and bring down statues and bring down monuments and, you know, these kind of things that just, you know, they talk out of both sides of their mouth, depending on what narrative they're trying to, you know, speak to and a group of people they're trying to appease or whatever. And I've always felt like, and you, know, you may or may not feel the same as like, our history is what our history is. And we need to 
respect, honor, learn from it, all those things, and try to be better going forward. But it does nobody any good to to do away with, tear monuments down, bring statues down, all that. That's not going to erase the history. I think you know we uh, those are reminders of where we've been and give us ideas on where we can go, where we can you know where we can ultimately be. But it's um, you know, we talk about it all the time. There's this narrative, and there's a certain group of people that will pounce on any opportunity to divide people. And it, it was just really refreshing to have somebody like Winston Sears on the show that when you look at her and before she starts speaking, you expect to hear one thing. And when she starts speaking, some people are surprised that how she looks at the same history that you and I look at and other people look at. And to your point, you know, when she speaks conservatively, or I, I say common with common sense, <laughs> then that, uh, that irritates some people, especially, you know, people of color and the you know, Democrats, liberals, they, they don't want her to have any voice, any platform whatsoever. But luckily, uh, she is in the position she's in, and she's had a tremendous platform this year, and I think she's used it in a very, very positive way. And she speaks, Bill, in a way that I like. There's a way to get your views and your viewpoints to the people you're talking to without talking down to people or without being condescending in certain ways. You know, And she said it two or three times on our podcast. She says, we can disagree without being disagreeable. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very under uh, underrated sentence, underrated way of life. And you and I can agree, or you and I can, can disagree on something fundamentally. But if I love you as a person, I love you as a person. And we don't have to agree on everything all the time, different viewpoints or what makes the world go around. But so many people have a hard time communicating with people that don't think the way they do in a professional, adult, respectful manner. And as I continue to push down the line as far as, you know, me being involved in politics and running for state office, that's one thing that I hope to always be able to try to do through the process and if I'm ever lucky enough to, to get elected. And that is bring my views and my viewpoints to that office represent the people of the district that elected me, regardless of if they voted for me or not, and keep my values at the forefront, but try to communicate respectfully and always leave the door open for people that have a different viewpoint, at least to listen and and try to represent the uh, everybody in, in the district. And some people just don't, they think when you're in politics, you can't have that uh, you can't let people run you over, uh, but you can certainly uh, communicate and be respectful in a way to try to unite people. Because at the end of the day, I think there's more that unites everybody than it is divides them. You just got to work hard to find those that, that common ground. It used to be that way in the United States. Um, you could be Democrat or Republican, but we were all American. And it seems to be slipping away. And now, you know, just using what you've just said, what Winston Sears said, you know, you can disagree without being disagreeable. That always seems to be what the Republicans say. You know, we're willing to respect your opinion, even when it, when it disagrees with ours. And we're willing more often than not for you to voice your opinion because we believe in the First Amendment. The left now doesn't believe in the First Amendment. They believe the government should control the First Amendment. That is to control your free speech. They're having, you know, outlets, we talked about this previously, like Facebook and Twitter, uh, allowing and thinking it's okay that government can control those platforms in order to control narratives that are coming out that are favorable to the government, or even controlling what you or I would say or spread around to our friends on that platform. And, you know, when I hear you can disagree without being disagreeable, the problem is, and I'm as honest can be, because, you know, I like Democrats. I have very good Democrat friends. But a lot of times what we see on the state and national level is that when the left takes a position, there is no alternative narrative. There is no alternative opinion that's worthwhile. And anybody who offers that one falls into then those certain categories of misogyny or sexist or 
or homophobe or transphobe or, or racist. And I could go on and on with the categorizations of trying to put people into buckets rather than allowing them to express themselves. And if their expressions are different from your or mine or from uh, liberals, uh, that they be respected. They're not respected. You're now classified and put away. And they're now saying that democracy, as they think it, is great when the government controls what the people do and say, which to me um, is the antithesis of a free society. And you only have to look back in the 60s and 70s when the Democrat Party, when we were probably more united, you know, even through our history, uh, as people being Americans first, uh, they were very much in protection of the First Amendment. Now that seems to have gone away. And they were very much in, pr in protection of those that might have differing views within the government. Now they think those views should be uniform or close to what the government offers or gives to the individual. We've seen this change over time, and it, and it does concern me. We, you and I have talked about it before. One of my biggest concerns, however, is how do you come back from that? How do you suddenly say, okay, we've had enough? And, and I've talked about it in the woke agenda. I think the woke is broke and, and, and it's moving away. But when that wave recedes, what's left? Uh, are we going to go back to being like we were on September 12th, uh, 2011, or 2001, I'm sorry? And what, what will this world look like? And so for me, um, you know, as 2022 closes, uh, I have a lot of fear about 2023 rather than a lot of hope. And I don't think I've ever ended one year going into the next year um, without that kind of hope, Hermie. And maybe I'm just, uh, you know, uh, it's the after Christmas hangover of emotions, but I'm I'm just a little concerned about what the future lot what holds what it holds for my children and your children in America in general. Yeah, I have the same thought, but what always brings me back to waking up every day trying to get up and go out and make a difference is I have confidence in the people in Virginia, and I have confidence in the people, the citizens of the United States. Because I, amongst all our challenges, I still believe that the majority of people in Virginia and the United States want the same thing. They just need people and, and somebody with a plan and a mission to, to try to bring them together. And you know, I, ultimately, a lot of times, more times than not, if you look back in my view, people, you know, with, through voting or through action or through other things they can do, you know, they, they figure it out. Yeah. And I'm hoping that people around here in Virginia in 2023 and in the United States moving forward, you know, I tell people every day, don't watch the news and decide what kind of shape you think the state is in or, or, or the kind of shape you think the country is in. Don't listen to your friends. Don't listen to politicians. Look at your bank account. Look at your living situation. Look at your job situation. Look at the challenges you have personally and make your own decisions on, am I better off than I was 12 months ago, two years ago? Am I heading in the right direction? What's the trend? If things are going well and you're happy with, you know, your daily life and what it's costing you, cost of living, cost to go to the grocery store, cost to fill your car up with gas, cost to get parts for your car, interest rate. You want to buy a home if you if you're okay with all that then okay but if you're not then know that there's things you can do you you have a voice you can speak it by supporting somebody that has different policies different ideas different views you know in a method of putting more money and control back into the hands of the people and away from the government so you know but, but if you watch the news depending on what channel you watch and if you talk to your friends depending on what line of work they're in or what's going on, you know, you can get all these different, you, know, you don't need other people to tell you if you're in a good spot. You can look at your everyday life and your family and your job and your schools and your, as I said, what it costs to live and what it costs to borrow and do. And hey, if you think we've got good people running the show and you're happy with it, by all means, continue down that path. But if you think, you know, in, in the real world, which is really frustrating for me, Bill, as it relates to politics and government. In the real world, if you're in charge and you fail, you get fired. And somebody else comes in to try to fix it. And in politics and in government, 
it, it doesn't always work that way. It, you, you get know, reelected. Are, <laughs> yeah, you get reelected. I mean, there's this, yeah. and I, I've seen parts of this, you know, we haven't even, we'll talk about the, the nomination method in my race that I just found out some information on that last night. We'll talk about that later in the show, but it's like, okay, here I am agreeing to step up and 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 take a leap of faith to go out and try to try to help by running for office. But there's people that are in Richmond now that they they've got this little wall built around them. You know, they don't want any they don't want an outsider in there. They want somebody that's going to go along with or horse trade with or negotiate with and what happens in most cases when that when that happens is the people that actually voted for those people to put them in office they get forgotten about or 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 left left behind and i've really noticed that you know people because as you well know i call things out call them as i see it when i think somebody's being a hypocrite i don't care if they're republican or democrat i call them out and then i get republicans calling me hey be careful about you know, mentioning that, talking about that, and I'm like, look, you know, got to think about the people that voted you to go in there and have some transparency and some accountability. But I have learned that there's a group over there that don't want anybody like me over there that that may have a different opinion of, you know, not what's best for me, but what's best for the people of the district that voted me to go over there. What would they want me to do? And not what can I do to, you know, enhance my position or to climb the political ladder or worry about the next election or what committee can I be on and all that. And so uh, that's been really one thing that I guess I shouldn't be surprised, but I am about how protective yeah. some legislators are about their turf, even though you don't listen to what people say, but if you just look at the record, they don't really get a whole lot done. No, and, you know, that reminded me over the holidays, I spoke with one of my great friends who we're going to have on the show, former Congressman Tom Garrett, served with me in the Senate, uh, served a couple terms in uh, in Congress. And he, one of his fascinating stories is, and is, if anyone knows Tom Garrett, Tom is his own man. Tom stands up for his principles and the principles that he defends for his constituents. So when he got to Congress, and there's a funny story in that because they wanted me to run for Congress, I didn't want to run. Uh, we'll talk about that. We're going to have him on next year. It's going to be a great podcast, his his story of politics and redemption. Uh, but what he said was when he got to uh, Washington, D.C. as a congressman, you had to go to these chairman of these you know, congressional committees and say, I want to be on your committee. And But every single one of them, and he'll tell you, uh, said, OK, well, I need you to vote for this farm bill. And he was like, well, there is no farm bill. I just need you to vote for this farm bill. We need to have this out. And he said, well, I'll take a look at it. And if it's good, then of course I'll vote for it. That wasn't a good enough answer for them, so he didn't get on the Ag Committee. Uh, he wasn't just willing to go along blankly with whatever they said was coming down the pike without looking at it first. Tom's not that way. I'm not that way. Hermie, you're not that way. You're going to commit to to principles, but not to people in politics, in those political positions, just because they say you have to in order to get along in order to get something done according to them. Now, in Congress, it's 435 people in, in Congress. It, if you want futility, then go be a politician, go be a congressman. There's not a lot that you can get done. And certainly uh, in state politics, Hermie, if you're elected, you'll find that you can write bills that are going to help the people in your area that might change the world for people that live in your constituency or the, or the whole of the Commonwealth. You can really get stuff done, but you also have to have these people I have to not pissed off these p- people, and unfortunately, I'm not good at that. I guess diplomacy has not been my strong suit. But so you have more of an opportunity, but in terms of getting along in the same way that, that those chairmen told Congressman Tom Garrett he had to get along if he wanted to serve or have any kind of clout whatsoever, uh, you're going to have to sacrifice some of your principles or do it my way. That's what you're going to face, to a lesser degree in the Commonwealth of Virginia, but it's still there, and that's the unfortunate part about politics. And and so, you know, since we're talking about it, how's your race going? Let's talk about that. Well, I, I mentioned to you, uh, actually, called you actually last night. There was a meeting, LDC meeting last night. Amongst legislative the, District Committee, right. Yeah, Legislative District Committee amongst the chairs of each committee in the new 17th District. Um, they were to be meeting 
to have a discussion to set up a, a follow-up meeting to vote on the nomination method in the race that I'm in, which, you know, we've talked about it. You know, I'm seeking the Republican nomination for Senate for the new 17th district. So Emily Brewer has also announced she's running. I've officially announced that I'm running. My campaign's up and running. And so they had a meeting last night down in Franklin to discuss what needed to happen, you know, but, and I got a copy of the agenda. I chose not to go and I chose not to send anybody from my campaign just because I guess different styles for different people, but I, I, I didn't think that I needed to personally be there or wanted to personally be there to try to insert myself or, 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 or get involved in that process. That is up to the LDC to decide that. Right. And so, uh, but we had been kind of moving along with the idea that it would be a primary because, you know, this is a new district, newly drawn 17th district. It's a long district. And by all accounts and information that we can gather, it's a basically a, a toss up, a 50 50 district Republican Democrat. And so, the, and I've told you this many times on this show and in private that while I think, you know, I wanted to step up and try to make a difference by running for this seat, ultimately my goal is for us to send the best possible candidate to the general election to give the Republican Party the best chance to win this seat because I think winning this seat is critical not only for the people of the 17th district, but for Republicans as a whole as it, as it relates to power in the Senate, as it relates to Governor Youngkin's agenda. Um, and things, if, if you believe in the things that we believe in, Republicans have to win this seat. And I just always believe, and I still do believe, and but always assumed that the LDC would pick primary because a primary, I'm not going to say forced, but a primary would have encouraged both Delegate Brewer and myself to get out and cover the entire district and go see all the voters, all the people, include everybody. That's been a big thing for me, you know, in the whole process is this thing of inclusion, giving everybody a voice. And, you know, and not only that, I felt like encouraging both candidates to get out across the, the district and meet all these voters would really set the table nicely for the general election. So whoever got the nomination, We've already been out to all these nooks and crannies in different parts of the district, introduced myself, talked to them, what I'm about, why am I running? I'm here to give you a choice. Here are the differences between Delegate Brewer and I. You make the best choice, and they're for you. And so all those things made me feel like, and I think most people on my team and most people I talk to within the political party, within the Republican Party, felt like it would be a primary. So we planned all that way kind of getting ready to gear up for that. But I found out last night, you know, around seven o'clock last night when I reached out to you that the LDC had voted for our nomination method to be a convention. So, and really basically what it boils down to is Suffolk and Alawite combined, just those two uh, committees have over 50% of the weighted vote in the 17th district. So just those two, they were the only two that voted for convention. Everybody else voted for primary. But because uh, because those two voted convention, now we're going to be looking at a convention. So I've, I spent most of my night last night and most of my day today, you know, with my team on the phone, Zoom calls, all that, trying to decide how to proceed, what to do next you know, re retool our, our program, our strategy, all that to get ready, you know, for a convention. So it is what it is. That's kind of what we're faced with. But, you know, ultimately, I'm disappointed because one of the things I've always wanted in this process was for everybody to have a chance to be a part of the process. 
And I have a concern, although it may not be one vote, it may not be two, three, five votes, but Bill, you know, in, in my situation, a group of people that's important to me is, is people with special needs family members. Right. And, you know, the idea of somebody from, say, Dinwiddie or Brunswick or Emporia Greensville that may have a special needs family member, they may be logistically prohibited from loading the family up and going to Suffolk or Isle of Wight to spend five, six hours at a convention one day. And so those little things like that, that probably don't have anything to do with the actual process of the whole thing really is the disappointing part uh, for me. So, you know, I've got to educate myself on conventions, how they work. I'm going to work just as hard or harder now that I know what the nomination method is, but what can you tell me or what can you tell us uh, as our listening group? Because you've probably been either involved directly or indirectly in both. So yeah. how do they work? What's the difference and what, what, uh, you know, what, what's in front of me when, it, when, when you talk about a convention? Okay. So the nomination process is how each party determines who will be the nominee uh, for a particular seat. And everybody has a different nominating process. In Virginia, we had nominating processes up to this year of you could nominate your candidate in a primary. And a primary is held in the uh, first Tuesday of June every year um, before the election, which is held in November. And it allows, because we are not a party that identifies by, or not a state that identifies by party, sorry about that. Uh, that means anybody can go in and vote, whoever they like, uh, regardless of whether they're Democrat or Republican. That's always been the big threat inside the Republican Party is that, well, if we have primaries, then Democrats can go out there and vote. and you know, nobody really thought that that would have um, the implications that it would, except we saw uh, some candidates in this year's uh, congressional elections that were elected because Democrats were told to go out and and vote for the nuttier candidate in the primary process. That way, their Democrat candidate would have a better shot uh, in the general election. So uh, primaries are open um, voting opportunities for anybody in the Senate district to come in on that June day and vote for whomever they like, and the person that gets the most votes wins the primary. The convention is a party-run, party-driven nominating process, and we have two party-driven processes here in Virginia. One is the Firehouse primary, which if you're noticing the congressional election uh, to replace uh, the late um, Don McEachin, my friend, who I miss very much, a uh, Democrat was a Firehouse primary. They, they set up voting locations in certain uh, areas, like firehouses, um, it's limited in terms of it's not at every polling place. And then the party faithful go in, sign a piece of paper that says, I promise to support whoever the nominee is, and they make their votes. That's the firehouse primary. The last is a convention, and it's interesting because your, your legislative district committee picked a convention. And in Virginia, Joe Morsey actually uh, wrote a bill, got it to the floor of the Senate and the House, and, and got it passed, which eliminates conventions from nominating processes in the future in the Commonwealth of Virginia used by either the Democrats or the Republicans. So this would be the last year that a convention can be utilized. And what a convention is, is basically this. And I hope this is not too squirrely and arcane or wonky political, but I'll try to explain it the best I can. In your local units, you were talking about Suffolk, Isle of Wight, uh, you know, Greensville, Emporia. We have units, we have uh, party units, which are committees. And every citizen who identifies with the party can join, become a member and go in and, and then work on committee district issues, whether you're Republican or Democrat. If you're Republican, you go to the Greensville County Republican Committee. You're a member. You can even be an officer. And they do the local political thing, but they also have, are intertwined with other committees in other counties for Senate and House districts, and then work together for the statewide gubernatorials and the congressionals as well. So those committees then, uh, depending on how many votes they deliver for Republicans, then get weighted. And so when you said the weighted vote between, were, were between two counties, Suffolk and Isle of Wight, that was over 51%. Weighted means the percentage of votes that Republicans received in that county in the last uh, election, well, the gubernatorial election or presidential. Then they weight them. So Suffolk would have more weight. They could have 500 voters come out in a primary. Uh, Emporia has 500 voters come out in a primary. It's 500 and 500. In a convention, they could have 500 conventioneers come out, and because of the weight, and I'm, I'm making the numbers up, there is a, 
there is 100 delegate votes. Emporia could have 500 members show up at a convention, and they only get nine votes total. So it's fractions of the people that would show up in Emporia rather than the strength of Suffolk. So in convention areas, um, the counties matter most. The county committees matter most because their weighted vote can actually turn an election, even though theoretically a candidate can have more votes than the other candidate and still lose in a convention because the weighted vote gave the other candidate with less votes more of the weighted vote and therefore gave them the victory. It's a weird way of doing it, but I, and I hope I'm making sense. But so in a convention, these committees, these local committees, these Republican committees dissolve every two years. And so they have to form up uh, by their very nature, a new body, a new committee. And they do that by what's called a mass meeting. And then in mass meetings, you know, people come in and join the committee and they, they elect a chairman, vice chairman, treasurer, secretary. And it's, you know, on a Saturday and it's what you do. In these type instances, then each of those unit committees, when they reform, will have a mass meeting. The candidates will have to bring a number of delegates who then have to get uh, basically accepted by the mass meeting to be a delegate at your, I guess, 17th legislative district convention, which would be the 17th Senate district. So first you have to sign up uh, delegates. You got to sign up those delegates, got to get them to go to the mass meeting so they get elected by the new formed unit body as delegates. Then if they're elected and there's no shenanigans like slating or we could go in all this stuff all day, then they have to go to the convention on another date and they have to go to the convention and they vote for whom they want. Their vote may be, you know, I've been to conventions where there have been four people and, they, and the committee had nine or the county had nine votes total. So each of them were, were like two votes, two in a fraction. And I've had them where, you know, uh, like Fairfax, a number of those people showed up at a state convention and their vote was worth one quarter of one person. So it's a really weird kind of thing how it comes together, as, we, as I explained earlier. So you have to get delegates, if you're a candidate, get people who are going to support you, get them to take time out of their day on a Saturday to go become a delegate, be elected as a delegate to the convention, then go take time out of their day to go again on another Saturday to go vote at the, at the Senate uh, convention. And in that thing, you know, Republicans and Democrats have said, well, you know, it makes sure we keep out the riffraff, the, the, the Democrats. But what it allows is intraparty politics and, and squabbles and scrimmages uh, and manipulation of rules and, and all sorts of things that, quite frankly, uh, ultimately, I think, in trying to make sure that we're electing conservatives and keeping the Democrats out, what we end up doing is kind of, in conventions, the potential is, not every time, but the potential is, is that it, usually people leave with hard feelings, mad, because somebody pulled some shenanigans on a rule, somebody pulled shenanigans on something else, somebody slid somebody else, and it, it doesn't tend to unify the Republican Party. It tends to, you know, everybody walks out and says, screw you, man, you know, that, that, was, a, that was BS, and I'm not helping your guy. And so... Conventions, by their nature, seem like it's going to be an, you know, a party nominating process that would be protective of the party. But in the end, what it demonstrates sometimes is the internal strife and, and, and differences that you have within that party and can harden some, some attitudes about people, about candidates, about other de delegates uh, uh, after chairman. And, and so it's kind of a, a strange process in that is the last year that we're going to have a convention is in 2023. After that, they're totally made illegal. So clearly, uh, Virginia, I voted against that, but Virginia in the General Assembly made a decision that conventions were not the way to nominate parties. And their reasoning was it excludes a lot of people from being in the process. Instead of having to dedicate a number of Saturdays to vote for your candidate, in a primary, you just walk up, you know it's on the first Tuesday of June, you walk in, you vote, you leave. Uh, even there's, you know, early balloting that you can do in primaries now. So um, it tends to shrink down the number of people that pick the nominee. And some people in Republican and Democrat parties want that. It's, you know, keep it small and control it all. Uh, but what happens is it's an insular process where you as a candidate or me as a candidate is only worried about signing people up to become delegates at their local committee unit mass meeting, and then focusing once they become that member of the delegation to get them to a, 
uh, to a convention center, you know, a high school gym or wherever it's held, instead of getting out, as you said, in the, in the whole of the district, and I think in your race, you know, Cliff Jenkins, I think, has announced, and there is no other opponent for him, so he's the nominee. He starts now. He's going from January all the way to June, all the way to November, getting to know the people while you're concerned and Emily's concerned about getting people signed up on a list to become delegates and get them to the convention by buses or however you can get them there to vote for you. And so it makes for a, a very different way of campaigning. It keeps your message, you know, it doesn't get your message out. It keeps it down. It's more internal. Uh, when right now, in this very important election, you need to be getting out in the whole of the 17th Senate District to introduce yourself to everybody. And I don't care what party they come from, whether it's the nomination process or the general election process, because this is a split district and you're going to have to have independents and crossovers from the other party who say, I believe in you, in the same way that the Democrats going to have to have independents and crossovers from the Republican Party saying, I trust you better than my Republican candidate choice. Yeah. Hope that, I mean, that, that was a anyway, thumbnail version a of a and, very, uh, very crazy, I, crazy thing. Yeah, uh, I learned that last night. So we've already started the process of trying to, you know, put our game plan together. And, you know, I, I told my team last night, it's like, you know, again, I go back and say again, I have no way of knowing if one method or the other is better for me or better for my opponent or what the, my whole thing was any, we need to try to re-energize people in this part of the state, because let's be honest, when it comes to the Senate, we've had no real representation or anybody really standing up and speaking for us, you know, in 20 plus years. Yeah. So this is an opportunity. Louise for Lucas, to put a right? Conservative in there. Louise Lucas uh, is Louise Lucas has been your senator. Yeah, and we just the, the the needs of the rural parts of uh, of this district hadn't been, at, you know, at the top of her radar. You know, she hasn't she hasn't been paying attention to us, in my opinion, as you always like to tell me. <laughs> so this is an opportunity for us to send somebody over there, a conservative, a Republican, that and 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 in my case, somebody that is not part of the establishment, somebody that does, you know, I, I don't owe anybody anything. I don't have to negotiate. You know, we need somebody over there that can stand up and is willing to stand up and, and bring attention to the needs that we have, what are certain, you know, which are certainly different than Fairfax and Northern Virginia, where the majority of the power and money is, you know, that's it's governing uh, Virginia. But all I, you know, I told my people last night, I said, okay, this is what we've been dealt. Is the steps we're going to take to prepare ourselves. And my hope is that regardless of the nomination process, it'll boil down to which candidate works the hardest and which candidate really is able to connect, connect um, with the voters the best. Yeah. And so whether it's a primary or whether it's a convention, that's what I'm going to continue to do. I'm going to go out and continue to, to bring my message. I'll put my message out front, meet as many people as possible, make sure they know they've got an option, you know, on the conservative side of, of the 17th district. And with the ultimate goal, as I said before, ultimate goal being having the best candidate possible on the Republican side in the general election for the 17th. Well, and, and, and it's an important election because not only the balance of power in the Senate is usually 21-19 out of 40 members, and it swings both ways, depending on the election year between Republican or Democrat, but even just geographically. If you think about Northern Virginia's population, Richmond population, Hampton Roads population, you know, Virginia Beach, they are more well represented in terms of sheer numbers than those of us in Southside and Southwest Virginia. Uh, our numbers dwindled because every 10 years with redistricting, they reapportion these, these, uh, these districts uh, based on the Constitution, and our populations are dwindling while theirs are getting bigger. And so they have more representation. So whoever wins this Senate uh, district, this new one created and carved out of redistricting alone, has to be somebody who's going to have a strong voice for Southside and Southwest Virginia, that we all have to link arms together. Otherwise, we keep getting run over by the Northern Virginia pain train and uh, telling us how life should be down here when they don't even know or couldn't find it 
on a map and really don't know what kind of lifestyle we live down here in terms of, you know, uh, the good societal country living that we la- we have. But we have some very important issues, whether it be with farmers or or industry or job training, uh, making sure we're creating safe futures for our kids. I mean, those are important issues. And and if you're going to go to the Senate and it's your aim to go to the Senate so you can be called senator and you can go to all these cocktail parties and do whatever the big boys, the bosses, the party bosses tell you, well, then you're not doing something for Southside, Virginia. If you go up there, don't go to the cocktail parties, you know, tell them my mama didn't name me senator. I'm here to do a job and only think about what the people back home need and want. And that's how you act. Then we've added another one to the roster. That's going to be a strong voice, whoever wins the race. And that's what we have to have. And I'm telling you, the Democrat, uh, Cliff Jenkins, nice guy. He's not going to fight for Southside. He's not going to fight for Southwest. He's going to go along with Northern Virginia. He's going to go along with Hampton Roads. He's going to go along with Richmond. He's going to do what the Democrat Liberal Party bosses tell him to do and will once again go another 20 years without good representation, representing the interests of those who live in Greensville, Suffolk, Emporia, Isle of Wight, uh, Brunswick, um, you know, what other, I, I may be forgetting some counties, but desperately need some good representation in the halls of Richmond and a strong voice who will stand up for them and get things done. That's what you need. So that's what we got coming up. And Al would say it's a, if not a once in a lifetime opportunity, a, certainly a once in a generation opportunity for us to put somebody forward to be elected for that seat. And I just hope the party, and I hope we don't do the same thing your mom told you not to do when you were <laughs> sworn in as a senator. She was very direct, and she said it in yeah, front of the so, governor, lieutenant um, governor, attorney general, everybody. She said, and after I took the oath, and I stupidly said, aren't you proud of me? Your son's a state senator now. She said, don't f*** it up. That's what she yeah. said. And I think about um, it every time I go into the, into the chamber. Now, because it's so important to I the people that you represent. Briefly so about, you yeah. I want to talk briefly about, you know, we, we, we touched on the lawsuit, and we've got an injunction right now. We're, we're working towards preparing a trial date and all that. Of course, you got session to go to first, but there's some media, a, a constant string of media stories that are coming out about <laughs> skill games yeah. and casinos and all that. But Shocking. before we get to that, I want to take a moment to thank once again the people at Paysomatic. Uh, Paysomatic is a gaming software that develops games that players love to play, and their players can win by using their skill every single time. These games are found in convenience stores, truck stops restaurants and bars and provide vital revenue to these small businesses across the Commonwealth of Virginia and other states as well, especially during these trying economic times and coming out of a pandemic. So I'm proud, as I know you are too, Bill, to partner with Paysomatic uh, on this podcast. It's one of our platforms, along with Sadler Stanley Racing, that gives us a chance to keep these messages out in front of the people that it affects on a daily basis. And uh, Paysomatic has stepped up in a big way to help us keep our word out. Yeah, they're a great company. And uh, and certainly uh, we're seeing recently, you were just mentioning those articles, um, skill games, uh, especially with your lawsuit, you got an injunction that says these are protected by First Amendment protections of the Constitution. We've done that now three times, twice in the circuit court, once in the appellate courts. You know, casinos just don't accept the answer and and they just want to dominate and, and monopolize uh, the gaming and gambling industry here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And so it seems like they're taking another tack. Before Hermie, they were saying, Oh, Hermie and Bill are dumbasses. They're never gonna get anything right. These guys are chuckleheads. There's no way they'll win. Then we won the first time they said it was fluke. Then they won we won the second time they said, well, it's, uh, it's still a fluke. And then the third time they're like, oh well, I guess we better do something. So what they're doing right now is they're having some of their buddies in the locations where they've been allowed uh, to uh, put their bricks and mortar down, their casinos down in Bristol area and in the Danville, Pennsylvania County area and in the Portsmouth area. And what you're seeing now is they're getting their local officials, their local prosecutors, to start trying to prosecute uh, people that have games. Now, before, uh, and before I even jump ahead even further, what they really did was when we were winning – Skill games were not games of chance, video games of chance. We've talked about it a lot. They have an element of skill in them. 
these games of chances started to proliferate after the Virginia General Assembly banned skill games that were being regulated by the Virginia ABC in convenience stores that had ABC licenses. And so then we saw this proliferation of these not games of skill, not games of chance, or games of chance just take over when Pacematic and, and other companies pulled back and, and obeyed the law until we got our injunction and were able to turn their machines back on. So now what casinos have done, and we kind of touched on it in some previous conversations, is they've now grouped all of those illegal slot machines, all those illegal VGTs, video game terminals, together with legitimate skill games. And now they're saying because, they're, you know, in order to make what we've done dirty again, they've brought in all the illegal games, and they, now they call them all skill games. If they're outside of a casino, they're a skill game. And if they're operating, they're a skill game. And when they're not, and we've talked about that a little bit, but now what they're trying to do is get some of their buddies to prosecute uh, in these areas, uh, unregistered skill games. Our injunction covers the 6,000 or so uh, skill games registered by the, by the ABC, but really uh, our argument applies to all skill games, not video games of chance. And so there's an issue there. So they're trying to get some prosecution, maybe get some different court rulings through some criminal prosecutions, but now they're starting this charm offensive where we've been seeing, and if you've been paying attention and everybody who listens to this should always go to VPAP and get the daily uh, newspaper clippings, but we've seen over and over four or five straight days, articles being written by the papers in these areas where the casinos seem to be uh, trying to knock skill games and trying to, trying to say they're illegal and, and, and putting out the casinos version of why these are so harmful. Uh, you've read some of these articles. What do you think, Herm? Yeah, it's uh, I'm starting to understand better now the term used a lot by Donald Trump when he was in office, fake news. <laughs> fake because news. Fake news. Fake news. Uh, because, as you said, the casinos are now using their power and control and influence. They, they have not been able to influence the court right. or the judge or the truth in the court of law, so in our lawsuit, so now they're working on how can they alter the courts of public opinion through media and through news. And, you know, we, there was a string of articles that came out up in the uh, paper up in the Bristol, Tennessee, Virginia Bristol Herald area. Courier? Yeah. Oh. And I did an interview with the guy and as a lady, um, actually, as a lady, Catherine said, no, 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 it was a guy in the Bristol paper. Oh, oh gotcha. and it was Sorry. a lady. Uh, later, we did. I did an interview with a lady with the Wall Street Journal, mm -hmm. but I'll cover the one in Bristol first. And you know, I did a probably forty-five minute to an hour uh, interview with him on because what what the casinos are doing by pushing these media outlets to put these stories out, if you read them, they're all about the casinos say the games of skill are this. Mm -hmm. The casino says they're bad because of this. The casinos say because, you know, and the judge, which I thought was the most telling part of what the court ruled in our last hearing that we got an extension of our injunction, the judge said it doesn't matter what y'all, the, the Commonwealth, tries to label these games as. They have an element of skill and they are protected speech. Doesn't matter what y'all try to say. Right. Okay. That's yep. what he said. Yep. So now the casinos are trying to use the newspapers, the media. Hey, we need a hit piece out on these skill games. Let me tell you why they're all bad. And the media is very powerful, but I can, and when given the chance, I will, every statement that these people in these newspapers say about skill games, we have proven them wrong every step of the way to yeah. a point. Yeah. Everything they are alleging, we're not just saying it's not true. We have proven it's not true. It goes back to me and you having a discussion before we even filed our lawsuit because we knew that train was coming. There was three or four other people that ran to the courthouse as soon as they could to file a lawsuit. Oh, we're being discriminated against. Oh, we're this, we're that. 
you know, have pity on us, turn our games back on. You and I, before anybody else was involved, when we decided to file this lawsuit, we said, we've got to, it's going to take a long time, but we've got to build this case from the ground up, just like we're building a house. And every assertion made, there was one, there was a series of articles made at the Bristol, Virginia paper. And there was a story that came out maybe two days, two or three days ago in the Wall Street Journal. And I know you did a, an interview with the lady with the Wall Street Journal. Yep. I personally stayed on the phone with her for an hour and a half. You got no quotes in the <laughs> article. And I got one page. I mean, I got one sentence yeah. out of a five-page article. So they were all about what the casinos say and what the casinos believe. And what the casinos want the general public to believe. But everything I could go by line by line, paragraph by paragraph, and everything that they allege is just not true. And again, we're not just saying it. We have proven it yeah. in the court of law. But they still, now they're down to, okay, what kind of wealth attorney across Virginia can we get to go in and kind of stir things up a little bit so we can create some havoc, you know, and maybe get the judge in the Sadler case to uh, to think this is all their fault. And these constant, you know, uh, just bad information about the lottery, yeah. and bad information about, you know, skill games impact on lottery. We've proven all that. Yeah, it's coming wrong. back but up again. Now the, now the casinos and the powerful people are using the 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 force of media mm -hmm. to get their side of the story out because guess what if you write it in the newspaper it doesn't have to pass the test of, of a courtroom and so mm -hmm. it's really really sad because they're I'm to given my time you've given some of your time to give not just our side but the truth of what this fight's been about and all these media outlets it's 99.9% .9 based on what the casinos tell them they want them to write. Well, and you know, the casinos, uh, think about this, the corporatization of the media and the shrinking number of reporters that we have. And, you know, Berkshire Hathaway buying up all these papers and stuff and shared media. So when they do an article in the Bristol Herald Courier, it's going to show up in eight other papers across the Commonwealth of Virginia. So it's more bang for their buck. But these are the ones that are supporting, holding up, propping up media at this point in time. And I love how they just say, oh, there's a criminal element in skill games. There's not a criminal element in legitimate skill games. There's a criminal element in VGTs, in those video game terminal, terminals, and those, uh, and those video slot machines. But the whole essence of creation of this industry, if we go back into the 50s and the 40s, or even earlier than that, is gambling came out of where? Criminal elements. Uh, it's now legitimate business. They're acting like they're, you guys are ruining the pristine nature of gambling. <laughs> you know, it's like, like somehow um, a small business owner who has a legitimate skill game registered in, uh, by the ABC who makes a couple grand off of that machine and allows people to come in who are not going to casinos is somehow ruining the sanctity of casinos, of gambling. How could you, you know, it's like you're trying to burn down the nuns in the church. And they come across in this one-sided way with the media, and we're seeing it now, where there's an onslaught attack on you and me, or, or an onslaught of this now one-sided media, where they, the reporter even talks to us, we give them the other side, we explain it to them, chapter and verse, send out the brief so they can read it, and I'm sure it crossed their eyes, because, you know, they'd rather have that story written for them than write it themselves. And you see this now charm offensive where I guess the point is, is that notice that all of these articles are coming out, of course, after the third injunction or the third court case, second injunction, but right before the general assembly session to try to curry favor showing up in every, and I, and I guarantee you every single legislator, all 140, we read, we read the daily feeds for, for Virginia and they're all reading it and that's what they want. And that way they've, they've come in and they're, they're coming in wearing the white hat and they're trying to put the black hat back again on skill games, grouping them all together, uh, trying to, to say that you 
uh, aren't doing the right things for small businesses. And then they trot out again the stupid claim, the lame claim that skill games hurts lottery, which we proved in a deposition, we proved in court, is an absolute lie. Not just a falsehood, it's a lie, a damnable lie. You know, you can have your own opinions, but you can't have your own set of facts, is the famous phrase. They continue to say that. And quite frankly, Hermie, we're now hearing from reputable small business owners that representatives of the Virginia Lottery, who said, who told the General Assembly that skill game were interfering and lessening their revenues, which was a lie. So they lied to the General Assembly, who then said under oath and admitted their, their executive director, yes, uh, skill games in some cases even helped uh, revenues in those stores where we had lottery sales. And it didn't hurt lottery sales. And they, but now they're back to lottery sales are being hurt, hurt by these skill games. And then what do they do? They send in representatives. And this is investigative journalism that you found out. And I heard it from other uh, convenience store operators that I've met with who wanted to understand what was going on and be living within the bounds of the law. That the, the Virginia lottery representatives are going to guys like you, Hermie, who own convenience stores, truck stops, and are saying, if you have skill games in your store, you can't have the lottery and we won't give you one of those big machines and we won't let you sell lottery products at your convenience store. You've heard that too, right? I had a gentleman, won't call a name yet, that leases one of my stores. He although he could have had over the years, he has never had skill games in his store. But last June, he was called to and attended a meeting hosted by the Virginia Lottery. I won't call the two men's names from the lottery that were there yet, but management level people that are in, in, in charge of these types of things for the lottery that told my guy in a nutshell, because my guy was inquiring about you know, and just to make sure this is clear, if you go into a convenience store where there's a lot of lottery sales and activity, sometimes you can go in and have to wait in line, maybe eight, nine, ten people in line. Small businesses, convenience store people are trying their best now to work with one cashier because cost of labor is so high, a lot of other struggles. But if you've got a, a line for grocery and that same person taking care of selling lottery tickets, it can take a while to, to pay for your drink or your bag of chips if you're waiting for people to scratch tickets and pick tickets and you got one cashier doing both things. So a lot of convenience store operators are going to the lottery and saying, hey, can you provide us one of these like vending machines? Mm -hmm. Like a kiosk. That people can buy lottery tickets and scratch tickets and all. We have one in Suffolk. You know, you saw the other day we went Suffolk yep. last week. There was one that Rita was working on, you know, in the corner. So I call them a vending machine, call them what you want. But it's an enhancement. It, it takes a little bit of pressure off your cashiers and your labor behind the counter. Let people go self-serve. Self-serve lottery machine. Go buy it. Well, my guy went and inquired about a vending machine to same thing. Take pressure off of his labor because he tries to operate now with one cashier because, because of cost of goods and businesses and all that. And he was basically told or he was asked, first of all, do you have skill games in your store? He said, I do not. They said, okay, we'll bring your vending machine in. And basically, it's a couple problems. Number one, they can't hold over a small business owner operator's head that if you legally operate skill games, we're not going to provide you a vending machine. That's bad in itself. But what they're trying to do, in my opinion, <laughs> in my opinion, is skew the numbers mm -hmm. to try to help them, you know, put, hey, they've got skill games in there, in that store, and look what it's done to lottery. They're not going to say, well, I gave this store a vending machine because they didn't have skill games. I didn't give uh, this guy a vending machine because he did have skill games. They're not going to get into all uh, that, but they that's a great they point. there in a meeting and say, if you've got skill games, you're not eligible for a, a vending machine. I mean, what kind of is that? Yeah, that, that not only is uh, extortion, 
uh, to try to control. Here's the government again, controlling what you can sell and who you can sell it to. And because in their minds, the skill game at this point in time is contrary to the government interest and may give too much empowerment to that store owner. And on top of that, that store owner makes a heck of a lot more money with that skill game than he or she does selling lottery. What's the number on lottery again? It's like you get 5%, 5% on each sale. So you buy a dollar scratcher. 5% of gross sales. So you buy a dollar scratcher, the convenience store gets 5 cents. That's right. See, so what I really want to see is I want to see if this gets out and they admit it and they need to, then I want to see every convenience store operator in Virginia to stand up and say, we're not, we're not putting up with this kind of government intrusion and boycott the, lo- the lottery. I think that's the best way to get the signal to them because did the lottery give you anything, you convenience store owners, any kind of add-on because now they have lottery on your cell phone, which takes away from the sales of lottery at your store? Did they do anything no. for you there? No. No. They didn't. So they're, they're such hypocrites, government hypocrites. That if they can't win, then they're and, and they're going to control the situation through well, this, extortion. This, this person ridiculous. Leases, this person leases my store. Said it, you know, just came out and he kind of said it like, you know, I guess they won't. I guess I'm supposed to be happy. I don't have skill gains because <laughs> now I got a vending machine, you know. And, I'm, and he told me the the date and where the meeting was and who was there. And I'm like, tell me again what they said. Mm. And he told me again, and I'm like. Whoa. So I, you know, I called you immediately, but I, it's just one example of, you know, and then a couple of things have been pitched to me, you know, I, despite all the problems and despite all the drama and, you know, I'm still hopeful that this general assembly session, that something will be done, something fair and equitable will be done because we, all we want to do is fairly operate our games, and we want them to be regulated. We want them to be taxed. We've offered that time and time and time and time and time again. Yeah. And, but every once in a while, somebody bring up, hey, this, I guess it's a JLOC study says, you know, skill games ought to be regulated under the lottery. And I'm like, excuse me, but the lottery has already on more than one occasion told all of us what they think of us. So, I don't think that's the best idea. They have proven not to be able to have an open mind when it comes to a small business owner's legal ability to operate something other than, you know, the lottery. But for them to be saying and or insinuating in any way to a small business owner, if if you don't do this, I'll do that. But if you're doing this, I'm not going to, I mean, it's just, yeah. As a state agency? Yeah. And you make a great point, too, and we'll end here on this issue, but you make a great point. <laughs> it's not just punishing the store owner who has a legitimate skill game. Uh, it's also skewing the results. So that sure so they, they made this statement that they're, they're losing money from skill, but they don't have any proof. So they orchestrate and manufacture the proof by this now take-it-or-leave-it type of attitude towards convenience stores it's it's outrageous it's obnoxious it should yeah. it should really make everybody who who sits there and says well maybe i ain't got any skin in the fight be a little more worried because if it's skill games today it's going to be something else tomorrow if it doesn't affect you today it will affect you tomorrow and if it doesn't affect you it's because maybe you're not a convenience store owner or somebody plays these games but it affects your community and it affects your freedom man and that's just intolerable but I, you know what but we're going to get to the well, bottom of that when we're in the general assembly and we're doing this podcast at my office my law office right there the stanley law group skyscraper we're going to be just doing a lot of podcasting and a lot of talking about what's going on in government to keep it all transparent but i'm going to be very interested to get some answers in that issue because i think it's just plain wrong well it's just it's just sad we we have been doing you know we've been winning and people in the casino world and the people within the lottery, they're mad. Okay. But their answer to that is instead of coming to the table and saying, okay, you're right. How can we slice your pie here? Y'all do y'all's deal. We got our deal, charitable, 
you know, they've wiped out all these other things that are going on, you know, just because they want to protect themselves. Right. And, you know, they have yet to decide to come to the table and say, okay, what can we do? How can we fix it? Because as I said, every one of these articles says these games are unregulated. Uh, excuse me. They were being regulated until the general assembly did away with it. Right. You know, Oh, they're, 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 they're games of chance. Uh, no, they're not. These games were taken prior to being put into stores, carried to the department of ABC for an independent analysis, all that. They were going to be the ones policing it. Can we put them in? Yes. Then we put them in. It's just been every step along the way that they, they're throwing this stuff up there, but it really has opened my eyes to the levels that, in this case, out of state special interests that are trying to dictate the policy by which that industry is going to be, you know, you got a casino industry coming to Virginia. Okay, great. You've already got a, a pretty favorable set of rules yeah. to start with. Yeah. <laughs> but they want to dictate the entire yeah. book on yeah. the policy that they're going to have to be governed under. Yeah. It's just, I, I look, I know I'm crazy. I just cannot understand, you know, and then they get all this. Okay, so we start winning. What's next? Well, let's get some Commonwealth attorneys in these areas where the casinos mm -hmm. are coming. We're going to. We're going to put a few things in the paper and we're going to create some other know, court challenges. Let's, let's try to get public opinion on our side. Let's, let's dirty yeah. them up as we go. And then let's make the legislators afraid to do anything uh, in next year's 2023 general assembly session. And then, and then they forget that the whole problems of unregulated illegal gaming was created by the casinos insisting that the government ban something and stop a regulatory process it ha already had in place that was actually controlling le legitimate uh, uh, skill games and keeping out the illegitimate illegal VGTs and video slot machines. They, they have no, it's like when one of my kids has no understanding what they did wrong and how they did it and why they did it. So, you know, it's, it's amazing. Then they just turn it back on skill games and this is their failed, this is a failed PR move. Uh, it was before it will be again. And I think ultimately uh, because we just, we're in a fight because we know we're right. And it's not just a fight about, it's not a fight about gambling. I'm against gambling. Uh, it's a fight about small businesses being able to participate in a marketplace created by the Virginia government, created a gaming industry and keeping one uh, area of that gaming industry from having a total and absolute monopoly. So here we go again. Even it's going to be a lot of fun in 2023, my friend. And we still have the court case coming up. We have the final trial on that. And we have, uh, we're, I think we're going to have a lot of discussion on casino gambling. And the casino's worried too, because you know what? We have to figure out a regulatory process for casino gambling. Some people want, oh, guess what? The Fox guarding the hen house, Virginia Lottery to oversee casino gambling. I'm sure casino gambling would love that. Uh, and then the other is the other argument we're having in the general assembly is creating a gaming commission like they do in Chicago and in Las Vegas. It's independent of the government, not suspect to or susceptible to uh, uh, to corruption, that kind of thing. And 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 so we're going to have a very good fight in the general assembly on what's the proper way of regulating gaming. And hopefully in the mix will be what's the right way of doing legitimate skill games and keeping out the illegal ones and regulating and taxing them fairly. But that's uh that's yet I'll to say be this seen. one more time for 2022. Despite the fact that we've had some form of skill game in our truck stop since the mid 1980s, the casinos are the ones that are later to the party that are now trying to rewrite the legislature to to, to, to run, run all that. You said it. I'll just repeat it. This is not about gambling at all. I would be perfectly fine with if they want to take every skill game out of every location in the Commonwealth of Virginia, so long as they do away with all the gambling, all the casinos, all of the everything, either no gambling at all, but if there's going to be gambling, it has to be done in a fair and equitable manner and legislated properly and fairly and not, you can't self-legislate. <laughs> and that's really what they're trying to, to do uh, in these things. And That's so right. 
I'm like you. I can deal with it or deal without it. But the way they're going about it now, it's one set of rules for you, another set of rules for me. And in the meantime, a lot of uh, unnecessary harm and hardship on small businesses. I get so, you know, some of these articles say, well, a casino, you know, you have to invest hundreds of thousands of dollars. And I'm like, millions. Do you have any idea how much I've invested in my businesses for the last 30 years? Yeah. You know, does that mean nothing? Yeah. You know, it's just unbelievable the short sightedness of some of these people. And look, some of these people in Richmond believe that all this shit. And they just, they just, Oh yeah, you know, casinos are are having to actually spend money and build buildings. And I'm like, what do you think the people that have been here all along have done? You know, the Virginia lotteries turning their back on us, and we've been we've been a partner with them for 35 years. Right. Yeah. We built the buildings. We turned the lights on. We paved the parking lot. We paid the help. We paid the insurance for five percent of lottery. We've been doing it for 35 years. All of a sudden, we don't camp. Yeah. And then lottery goes in different directions is. and goes online. You can do it on your computer. You can do it on your cell phone. And you don't get a piece of that. They don't day. need us anymore. Yeah. And they, it, we brought them to the dance, and now they've dumped us for the pretty girl from Vegas. That's right. You know? Dance with the one that brung you, my dad used to always say. Now, as we end up here, uh, this part of our, our of our podcast, um, you know, how was your Christmas? I mean, I had a wonderful Christmas. We talked about the last episode. I've gotten so many phone calls about our last episode, the the kind of holiday tradition. That was a great fun. If you haven't listened to it, go back and listen to it. We talk about our own family traditions and stuff. And and uh, and certainly, uh, I think it played out incredibly well in terms of my Christmas. How was yours? It was great. Uh, we had some issues with, you know, we had a, some terrible storms and wind storms and things that came through here. Uh, that caused us some problems, you know, Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, uh, things of that nature. But overall, we um, uh, we had everybody together, and uh, we had a lot of fun. We did a, something a little bit different at my mom and dad's. We did a a, a white elephant Christmas exchange amongst our family. Yeah. Uh, I ended up with a bidet. Um, a bidet. To, uh, a butt yeah. washer. A butt washer. <laughs> yeah. Butt sprayer. So uh, wow. that's that's how that ended up for me. You didn't, um, did you trade you know, to get so that blessed one? in so many ways? And my girls were all here and, you know, uh, we got to see, uh, the family and of course we ate a lot. Um, you know, my, we did a, started a new tradition of Christmas morning going over to Cora's house. Now that her and Cameron are married and have her house, they had us over for breakfast Christmas morning. Hmm. And I hope that's something we can continue to do because, you know, Cameron has his family stuff and Cora has family stuff to do with us. And, you know, there gets to be a lot of stuff going on. And so uh, we, we started a new tradition going over to Cora and Cameron's house uh, Christmas morning, which I really enjoyed, but uh, we're, we're, we're blessed and everybody, you know, we had a great time and, you know, one of the highlights of my Christmas, believe it or not, Bill, you know, you sent me a picture of uh, your son Chandler when he walked in and saw the Santa Claus that left the Sim uh, sim seat racing rig for him and little fella uh, was kind of overcome with emotion it was. and that's what uh, that's what Christmas morning in Santa Claus is all about yeah and and uh, so we had a good Christmas and uh, thanks for asking and uh, and basically uh, we started early in the morning opened Santa's gifts uh, then went and got my mom had had a big breakfast and we opened gifts with my mother at my house and then we had to take my mother back and go to Roanoke to get with the in-laws and spend time that, you know, road looks like an hour down, an hour back. So it kind of busted up the day. It felt more like we were on a schedule than kind of relaxed. But then when we came back home, we usually, we were now, the tradition that we now have is that we kind of wait on some of our gifts to each other until the end. So we do it at night after we get all the family stuff done. And and that was a gift, uh, not from Santa. It was too expensive from Sa- for Santa to put in a sack. But uh, we put it in the basement, uh, put it together, and... Um, and it was an emotional reaction for him. I mean, he was really thrilled to get the racing simulator and, and he cried and I cried and my wife cried. And, and it was just one of those moments of, of that pure joy, you know, it's, and it's, and again, we, we always stress, it's not the material things. It's really uh, the gift of life that, that Jesus Christ gives us through his life and the gift of salvation and eternity. Uh, and that we could all be together uh, in those loving moments, um, 
forever. And so it was a really nice way to end it. I want to tell you, Hermie, I took your advice when it came to the bo- 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 boyfriend. <laughs> I let it. Came over Christmas Eve, fell asleep on my couch. I fed him dinner, fed him prime rib. We made a nice rib roast and, you know, and then it's always like they dominate the living room. And so it's like, you have to go into your bedroom and, and, and sit there, but then, you know, you got to keep a watch out. So, you know, I had some, <laughs> had some moments, but I did it and then let him come back on Christmas evening. So there I did it. Okay. Uh, that's you know. just the beginning though. That's not, that's not the end of the journey. It's an invasion, man. I mean, it's just a, an all-out invasion of you know what your expectations you, and privacy is. But they can be together at your house, or she'll be with him at at his house, or wherever they're telling you they are. Mm-hmm. Well, my wife has been telling me that, and she said, "Oh, finally, when Hermie tells you, you believe him." I said, oh, "I just it's confirmation. It's you know because you can be you know mom being mom, but you know when you hear it from your buddy and your buddy's got three daughters, well, okay." I mean, all right, I'm going to give it a shot. So I'm, I'm, it's a work in progress, Herm. I'm we working did, on we it. have done, you know, we got three. Yeah. And I started with Angie's uh, encouragement, started doing everything we could do. Like we built a movie room at my house. We, 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 we built another, we, when, we, when we did a renovation been 15 years or so ago now, we added our bedroom, mine and Angie's, way on the back of the house. So that our girls could have, you know, friends over and have little parties and things, movie room upstairs, and it's almost like we weren't there. Wow! So <laughs> not happening in my house. Do, you, <laughs> you can either do all that, or you can be sitting up at Saturday night wondering where the hell are they? So I, on an addition to my house, is a gun turret. Is that a problem? <laughs> what a gun turret! You know, like a sniper's nest. Uh, right yeah. in the middle so I can see everything. You handle it how you see fit. <laughs> I'm just telling you, you really don't have, you, you, it's only two choices. Accommodate them to be there or not know where they are. All right. And that's well, really the yeah. long and short of it. All right. Well, we're running out of time. What's your New Year's resolution for 2023 <laughs> there, buddy? Yeah. Let's get on another subject. What's that? What's your New Year's resolution for 2023? Keep kicking ass. Yeah. Um, in the court. And try to uh, move along this campaign to run for Senate. I'm really passionate about that. And yeah. uh, I'm going to attack that like I do my everyday life and everyday business. Um, I'm going to uh, have fun doing this podcast with you in 2023. I'm looking forward to winning a few trophies on the racetrack uh, with Sadler Stanley Racing. And, you know, uh, I could sit here and tell you that I'm going on this major diet and I'm going to lose all this weight and get in shape and run a marathon and do all that. But that yeah. happens. So. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, that's a pretty good list. How all about right. you? What do you mean? All right. Well, thanks for joining us. Uh, How about your new year's restitution? All right. Next week's left leaning right and turning left episode. We're going to, it's going to be great. It's our last You're one. You're not going to answer me. Are you? I'm sorry. What? You went no in new year's there. resolutions. Yeah, I got one. Actually, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I've got two. One is I'm, I'm going to make more time for my family. That is, you know, I kind of got into it a little bit this year, but I realized what I was missing. I, politics and the law and litigation and client stuff takes up so much time. It has to be if there's no other time, you know, I, I've got to kind of pare that down a little bit and be more, uh, because they've grown up so fast and I got to be more, more judicious about my time, especially with my family, even in an election year, uh, maybe drag them with me. But then uh, I'm going to quit my tobacco habit. It's going to be gone. What? And you can monitor it. Yes. Yes. Really? I am quitting my tobacco habit. Yeah. When? I have a nasty tobacco habit that I try not to show in public. Um, when? Now. Like this weekend. Okay. Yeah. Because it's not only making more time for your kids, you want to actually be alive to see them. I think that's kind of a good yeah. combo. And maybe. And you cut that, cut that out of your lifestyle, too. You can actually, out of your pocket, Sponsor all these people you've offered rides to in Saddle Stand Racing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, at least some of them. Uh, yeah. yeah. So so that's my New Year's resolution. Be more time with family and uh, quit that nasty tobacco habit. Every single one of you out there should t- uh, quit that nasty tobacco habit if you've got it. Ladies and gentlemen, we're closing out 2022. 
And we've got so much coming up. We've got so many great guests coming in 2023. The lineup is unbelievable. And Hermie and I are going to be in Richmond. Hermie's going to be uh, not just campaigning out there, but he's going to come in. We're going to try to do as many of these, maybe try twice a week and sometime. So let everybody know uh, exactly what's going on with their government uh, and let everybody know exactly, update them on everything, all these issues that we've talked about uh, for the year. And we're going to have some great guests. So as we end this portion and before I read for the final time this year, the Manscaped commercial, Hermie, I want you to pick out, we've had politicians, wrestlers, race car drivers, and innovators. Last week, I asked you to pick out your favorite interview uh, politically, and you picked a very good one, former Governor George Allen. So tell me right now, and we're going to put it on the end of this podcast, pick your favorite race car, race driver, race promoter, whoever we interviewed when it had to do with the world of racing. Tell us what your favorite one is, and we're going to put it right after, the, after we come back from this Manscaped commercial. I thought about this, uh, you know, a lot because we had a lot of fun guests in the racing world. I've told you this many, many times. The biggest assets I have in my life these days are the friends and the relationships that I uh, that I made through my years of racing, doing television and traveling and all those kind of things. Um, this one's a tough one for me because, and I hope at some point in time we can get both of these interviews back on. But the the two most entertaining shows that were, uh, you know, featured some of my NASCAR friends were Kenny Wallace and Kyle Petty. Mm -hmm. But I think for the overall purposes of, uh, of the show and, and the one that, you know, that, uh, that I learned the most about or, or learned the most from and enjoyed, uh, I, I, I if I've got to pick one and you're making me pick one, yes. Um, I've got to pick Kyle Petty. All right. There you go, ladies and gentlemen. You're going to listen to one of these great interviews. Kyle Petty, it was an incredible interview we did earlier in the year. Look, go back through our whole library. We've got now 50 shows that you can pick from with a lot of incredible guests. From Kyle Petty, Kenny Wallace, to Dale Earnhardt Jr., Ray Evernham. The list goes on and on when it comes to great race car drivers and, and people that are involved in the racing industry. So, uh not only are you looking back on the last 50 shows, but I want to tell you, looking forward on the next 50 shows, we've got a powerhouse lineup of, ra of interviewing uh, people in the racing industry, and we're looking forward to that. Uh, Hermie, I have loved this uh, this year on this podcast and the race team. Looking forward to SSR Racing uh, taking to the track uh, soon, like within 90 days or so. And what I've really, really loved is the sponsorship that has come to us from manscaped.com because you know when when we were opening gifts this year uh there were two manscaped boxes uh for members of my family from us to them and they opened it up none of them were embarrassed none of them said what is this every single one of them said oh man i was hoping you were going to do this because of their great get products 20 off they got i got 20 percent. santa claus got 20 percent off so uh but they all got it and they're excited promo about code it saddler promo code saddler was put in for each one of these boxes man i'm telling you and, and I, was, I was waiting for the look in the face because, you know, you've always said, you know, how would you feel if, you, you know, you gave one of your relatives Manscaped? What, what would they do? Every single one of them was, was thrilled and happy, and they were all joking about the Manscaped commercials that we love to read on this. So I'm going to read this last one as we go into the year. Okay. <clears throat> hey, fellas, this episode of Leaning Right and Turning Left is brought to you by our favorite producers of Ball Trimmers, Manscaped. The global leaders in below-the-waist grooming are leaving 2022 with brand new products. Persevere Cologne and Persevere Body Wash. 2023 is the year to up your hygiene game and smell amazing. And Manscaped wants to help you do so with this special offer. Use the promo code. What's the promo code? Sadler, S-A-D-L-E-R. Use that promo code at checkout and receive 20% off and free shipping at manscaped.com. Come on, guys. Let's take the leap into the new year and join the 7 million men who have already trust Manscaped, including that trucker we met at your truck stop in Suffolk. Wasn't that funny? That was hilarious. He came right well, up to right us. Right up out of the blue and started asking us, hey, have y'all heard of this product, yeah. Manscaped? He, he's, he was a living, breathing, I mean, commercial for Manscaped. Yeah, and he, and he was telling us how, you know, he could buy it, uh, you know, commercially, but didn't know he could order it from Manscaped.com, and he travels a lot, but he has a P.O. box, and so we told him. And uh, we even gave him the promo code. That promo code is... 
Sadler, S-A-D-L-E-R. And Hermie, I want to tell you, with 2023 being on the way, the last thing you want to do is be the guy with pubes getting in your way and making it your best yet year. You know what I'm saying? We certainly can't have that. I mean, the, the, the Manscaped Lawnmower 4.0 is the leader of performance package. The leader in the performance package 4.0. And I gave all of my loved ones, well, the male loved ones this year, the performance, performance package 4.0, and they loved it. It's the perfect package for your package. Manscaped engineered the ultimate groin and body trimmer by focusing on intelligent functionality and an incredibly comfortable grooming experience. Hermie, I'm telling you this. But this year, you can shave the uh, loose pines off your wood with the best tool for the job, the Lawn Mower 4.0. It will take down everything in its path. And if you have nose and ear hair, hair that's a problem, well, guess what? Manscaped has you covered with their Weed Whacker. It'll change the game for you. It'll whack your worst weeds in your nose. And let me tell you, we put a couple of those into stockings. They fit perfectly. People thought they were great gifts to have in your stocking. But it doesn't stop there, Hermie, because confidence is going to be king in 2023. You know what else I'm confident about, Hermie? Smelling like a million bucks. That's right. You asked and Manscaped now has answered. Introducing the brand new Manscaped Persevere, Persevere Body Wash and Persevere Cologne. I mean, talk about being clean. I use the, the body wash. I love it. It's got a great manly smell. You don't want to have that feminine smell. I've been, I was using mango body wash uh, with my wife's and, and I had kind of a, Oh, Bill. Yeah. I mean, I kind of have a sensitive <laughs> fruity smell and I, I didn't, you know, I'd be hanging out with my guys going, man, somebody like, does somebody smell flowers? And I'm like, not me. I'm not it. You know, it's mango. So here they have got, you the told body me wash. that this manscaped.com, this relationship and this sponsorship that you use all these products religiously. Yes. And it has taken years off of your life. Yes. Yes. It has. Or added years to your life. Which it, one was it? Uh, I'll have to look back and see which one that was. But I'm telling you right now, when you make talk, you feel younger, how about that? You feel younger indeed. And when you're talking about being clean, feeling good, smelling good, the Persevere body wash that I use for Manscaped solves all three for the perfect addition for your daily grooming routine. In the shower, it's light, it's got a great woodsy scent to it. It's got aloe vera in it so it doesn't dry out your skin, and it keeps your skin feeling clean, nice, and moisturized. The Persevere Cologne is like the body wash with a light, woodsy scent that answers the call of the wild Ooh, by leaving you smelling like a man forged from the earth. It's also cruelty-free. What kind of animal was that? I don't know if it was an animal. Just whatever came out oh. of my mouth at that moment. It's from my Persevere Cologne, baby. So... Yeah. Yeah. But it's cruelty free, which is very important. You know, you and I are are, are dog and animal lovers, and we, uh, we love the protection of animals. And it's cruelty free, dye free, paraben free, and vegan. So you know you're in the right hands when you're smelling right. Use that promo code. What is it again? Promo code Sadler S A D L E R. It's promo code Sadler for twenty percent on free shipping at Manscaped.com. I'm telling you what. 2023 is on its way. The woods are here and smell amazing. Are you ready to jump in and join me with Manscaped, Hermie? Yes, you are. Ladies and gentlemen, I guess I am. get 20% off in free shipping. That's We've said it before. We're going to say it again with promo code Sadler at Manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping anywhere in the world at Manscaped.com and use that promo code Sadler. Happy New Year to your balls, Hermie. <laughs> They thank you so much <laughs> oh, for the consideration. And Bill. speaking of which, uh, I also sent you a picture that we got this package, uh, and not the performance package, but we got this package late, like Christmas Eve, and we opened it up, and there were Hermes balls. Hermes balls. balls. Hermes balls were there, yep. and we immediately put Hermes balls on the tree and then took a picture and yep. sent it to you. So thank you it, for that you nice Christmas picture. Gift. It lit your Christmas tree right up. It lit the Christmas tree. I mean, it's even the, cla the cats continuously stare at them. I don't know about you, but it put... It put my sponsor, the head lady in charge of Vista Installations, put her really into the Christmas spirit. Yes. <laughs> yes. And the cats. But thank you for autographing it. That Those are treasured now uh, traditions of our Christmas tree and will be for times immortal and time to come. And we'll pass them down to the kids. I, I know they're all going to fight over that when they're reading the wills after mom and dad are dead. So, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to leave you now in the end of 2022. We've enjoyed this ride so much, and we got much more ride to go. You got another year, another 50 episodes. Uh, we're going to keep doing this as long as you like listening to us. We appreciate you listening. We want everybody to have a sa safe and happy new year and, and be with your loved ones. And now we've got one of the greatest interviews of all time. Who was it again? The one. <laughs> 
the only Cal Petty. Petty. That's right. Ladies and gentlemen, we love you. God bless every single one of you. Enjoy the interview. Happy New Year. Yeah, Happy New Year. Hi, folks. This is Hermie Sadler. Thanks for listening to our all-new podcast, Leaning Right and Turning Left with Sadler and the Senator. I hope you are enjoying the show as much as Senator Stanley and I enjoy bringing it to you. Whether you're a family traveling together or a truck driver hauling freight up and down the highway, I hope you will take the time to visit one of our Sadler Travel Plaza locations in Virginia and North Carolina. Sadler Travel Plaza locations are licensed dealer locations for pilot travel centers. And we also carry Shell Motiva Petroleum products for our four-wheel friends. We pride ourselves on providing one-stop shopping for service, food, and entertainment. Our food options include Five Guys Burgers and Fries, Quiznos, Dairy Queen, Hermie Sadler's Faux Show Bar and Grill, Victory Lane Restaurant, Hunt Brothers Pizza, Dunkin' Donuts, and much, much more. Our locations include Sadler Travel Plaza in South Hill, located off I-85 at Exit 12. The Sadler Travel Plaza of Emporia, which is conveniently located on Exit 11D off I-95. And Sadler Travel Plaza on Highway 58 in Suffolk. We also have our North Carolina location, Sadler Travel Plaza in Dunn, North Carolina. That's Exit 75 off I-95. We appreciate all of our customers. And Bill and I appreciate you listening to Leaning Right and Turning Left with Sadler and the Senator, powered by Pace Maddie. Hey, this is Bill Stanley, Hermie Sadler's sidekick on this podcast. When I'm not in Richmond at the Capitol or doing this podcast, my real job for the past 27 years is as a trial attorney with the Stanley Law Group. Here at the Stanley Law Group, we represent our clients in every courthouse in the Commonwealth. No problem is too small for us to solve. No case is too big for us to win. Whether it's criminal charges, traffic offenses, civil disputes, litigation matters of any sort, we handle it all. We make sure that we treat every client like family because they are to us. Your problem is our problem. Your success is our success because we hate to lose more than we love to win. And believe me, we win a lot. Don't believe me? Go ask Hermie. I'm his favorite lawyer and he hates lawyers. So give us a call at 540-721-6028 and let us help you. Or visit our website at www.vastanleylawgroup.com. That's www.vastanleylawgroup.com. At the Stanley Law Group, we'll make sure we're the lawyers that you swear by and not at. And we're back. I'm Virginia State Senator Bill Stanley, still leaning right. And I'm Hermie Sadler. I'm turning left. And finally, Senator Stanley, Ooh. we have made the connection and got the guest. We've been talking about him here for a couple weeks. New book out. We'll talk about that. Yes. And we, uh, we finally made the schedules work and we've been excited about this for a long time. It's long time friend and got a chance to race with him and work with him in television and uh, still call him a friend to this day is none other than Kyle Petty. Kyle, thank you so much for taking a, a few moments with us. I know you're, you're busy. You're writing a book. You're running a nursery service. You got a lot of stuff going on. Well, and Andy <laughs> might be the future driver of our open wheel modified number 30. Oh, I wasn't supposed to ask him. Was I? All right. Oh, Not yet. there we go. Not yet. Uh, there we go. Not yeah. yet. <laughs> well, that, listen, thank you guys. I, I, we have been trying to set this up, trying to set this up. And, um, you know, it's not my schedule anymore. I got a four-year-old, a two-year-old, and a two-month-old. It's their schedule, uh, and that's why it seems like we just couldn't get it done. So thank you guys for hanging with me and, and holding out a place for well, me. Well, look, I've, I've, been, to be on I've been working through your agent, Rutledge Wood, you know, <laughs> oh, and he, oh, God. you know, I've been getting my, my people in touch with your people, which I was told was his people, uh, but we finally got everybody on the same page. So there you go. Yeah, that, that that might be the problem, man. That might be the problem. <laughs> I don't know what door you came in with Rutledge, but it wasn't the front door. It was not. Look, um, <laughs> we, we want to talk. We got a lot of things to cover, a lot of things to talk about. But I want to start now, and then we'll start there and, and go back. Senator Stanley, you know, mentioned, mentioned the book. And I know you've been busy for the last couple of months promoting the book, doing signings. I appreciate the one you sent me. Elliot, uh, he got one as well. So why a book? And why now? 
So here's what happened. Um, so you know, I play I play music. You can, yep. I got guitars. You played me. at faux shows. Playing at faux shows several years yeah, ago was really what put you on the map. No, I did play at faux shows. Yeah, yeah, that's at the top of my resume, as a matter there of fact. You go. There so you go. So I, I, I played there, but you know, I, so I play and I've, I've written forever, uh, and I talk about that a little bit in the book. But when the pandemic started, um, when you know, we let's go back to to February, March, April, right along in there. I get up at five thirty every morning. I play the guitar. I write. I work out. That's my time. That that's my time, and and that that's where my time of the day is. So um, when everything happened. Then Morgan, my wife, she was pregnant with our second child, Cotton, and no one knew how the, how COVID would affect pregnancy, how it was going to affect women. Uh, so we just locked up. We just locked up. And for so long, people have said, "Man, won't you won't you write down some of those crazy stories? Why don't you just write down some of that stuff? Just just as a record, just write it down." And I got to thinking because I was so you know you're just here, and and I got to thinking about it, and I'm thinking, man. You know what? I, uh, I was born in June of 1960, went to Daytona in July of 1960, and been going to the racetrack ever since. I grew up uh, not only with my dad, but I grew up in the garage area, spending the summers with David Pearson and Kelly Yarborough and Richard Petty and Bobby and Donnie and Charlie Glotzbach and Bobby Isaac and Kale, guys like that. Then I got to see Earnhardt come along. Then I got to see you know, Jeff Gordon and those guys. Then Jimmy Johnson comes along and I get to race against all those guys. So I've been here a long time. Uh, so I, I decided I would start writing some stuff. You know, I just instead of doing the music in the mornings, I'd write down stuff. So the very first story I wrote, I, I will tell you this, I'm waiting to hear back from the Guinness Book of World Records um, because my wife said it was quite possibly the longest run on sentence with no punctuation, <laughs> more misspelled words. <laughs> And she had ever seen in her life, but she said, "There's something in there. There's something in there." So I kept doing it and um, got up with Ellis Hennigan, who had written Michael's book, uh, and I knew it. You didn't have to educate him; he already knew about racing, uh, and he kind of led me in the right direction. So I think really the pandemic and just having time. You know how your schedule yeah, is. Yeah. I know how my schedule is, and I know how it was as we drove and when we raced. There was no time for you. You know, you and the time that was yours you gave to your family uh, because that was the important thing was to give back to your kids and to your family. So this was the first time I had some time um, in a 24 hour period that I could spend at least a couple hours and do stuff. So it, it took a couple of years. It took about a year and a half to get it all, all put down. But um, you know, it, it came out. I'm, I'm, I'm pleased with it. I was proud of it. How, when, how, how, when how it was came. the, how was the reception to it been so far? I see, of course you, you go places and sign autographs, people, you know, people love you, yeah. all that. But how, how is the, you know, for, for the, for the people that really view books like this for the, for the content? And I mean, how, what, what kind of feedback are you getting from the book? So, that, you know, it's been good. Um, you know, I, here, and this is what I, I want, I'm going to say this to you and, and you'll understand this. Uh, a lot of people that I've said this to don't understand it. Um, but, but, you know, I, you got a copy. I sent you guys. I sent most yep. everybody I know. People I've raced against. People that don't mm -hmm. even like me, I sent a book. <laughs> you yep. know what I mean? Send them I mean, two books. Just to say. <laughs> yeah, so just, just, just here it is. So the first person, no joke, the first person I heard back from was Mark Martin. And, I, wow. I, I, and when, I, when, I, when I hung up the phone, I called my wife. I said, I don't care if this book sells any. I, I don't care. I, the conversation I just had with Mark Martin may be one of the most special conversations I've ever had in my life. Um, and then I got a text and, and an email from Ray Evernham and then, you know, a couple other people. And I think it's your peers. You know, that, that's, who you, that's who you seek approval from. That's who you tried to beat your whole life are your peers. And, and when they say stuff, um, it, it means a lot. The reception, you know, for, for selling and you know, we were on a Wall Street Journal bestseller list on two or three stuff like that. Amazon, that's all cool. That, believe me, that's that that is cool because the fans uh, are, are what we do a lot of things we do for. Uh, but that gratification in your heart that fills your heart uh, is your family and your friends and what they have to say about it. And that that to me has been the best thing, the best reception. Well, let me tell you, um, I'm first. I think I'm the only person here that went to Amazon and bought the book. Um, and read it cover to cover. And, and I'm just going to say a couple things. It's a beautiful, wonderful story. It's a great read. And if you've heard Kyle Petty in your 
you know, when you've watched him on TV, it's in his voice. So it's so easy then to, to have Kyle Petty there as you're, you know, in your bed reading, telling you a story in his voice, in his words, in his way. And, and a lot of books don't have that. A lot of books are dry. I always read nonfiction. I don't read fiction stuff. But but it, it it made it flow so unbelievably well, and in each in each paragraph, there is a little story, but in each chapter there is a lesson, and I mean that sincerely. And and there's a passage I want to read at some point uh, that really struck me to the point where I read it three times, and then I read it to my wife, and it made such a difference. It encapsulated what it was to be a father, to be a parent. Uh, you've got racing stories in here, but you what you really have is you know the overarching uh, petty family story and your place in it. But really, you know, the tribute to Adam all the way through uh, just matters so much. And so, you know what I'm going to do? I put on my glasses and I'm going to read this. And this, this probably, this, these two paragraphs has meant more to me in any book I've read in such a long time. And by the way, William Faulkner has the world record for the longest run on single sentence. I think it was 13 pages. So I'm sure you didn't hit that. Uh, and that was actually published. <laughs> but listen to this. And I think you probably would read it much better than I. But but again, I, I dog-eared the page so, and, and read it, have read it at least three or four times already, but here it is. Uh, in my short time on earth, I witnessed too many fathers living vicariously through their sons, pushing their sons to do things the fathers wish they had done themselves, things the sons didn't really have a passion for. The sons just went along because it was that they didn't want to disappoint their dad. Mothers do that with their daughters too, I suppose, but I'd seen it more with fathers and sons. I vowed I would never do that with any of my children. Maybe that's just me talking, drawing from my own experience as a father and especially as a son. But too many of us spend too much time in our youths either being forced or pressured to act like adults. And then when we get to be adults, it's too late to act like children. Certainly until you're out of school and on your own and you'll have to pull the trigger on some kind of grown-up life. Just enjoy yourself. Try to learn. Figure out what you're good at and what you love. Discover what you really can't stand. Try things, even if they turn out to be the wrong things. Keep an open mind. You're never going to be 12 or 15 or 18 or 21 again. Before you take on all the responsibilities of adulthood, take the time to figure out what you care about and who you are. I mean, for me, that was the most moving part of this book. It encapsulates, I think, the entire overarching story in this book, Swerve or Die. And it was so moving to me that I, when I read it over and over, it meant something to me too, as a father and upon reflection as a son and as a child. And so thank you for that. Uh, I, I, I can tell you there's no other passage that I've ever marked that really uh, spoke to me in that way. So uh, and what, what is the, lot. just so for the people listening, what is the context of that, of that passage? What, what, what I see it's in the, it's, it's about, uh, it's, uh, it's under the uh, title of the chapter, Boy Wonder. And quite frankly, he's talking yeah. about the decisions of his child, Adam, getting into racing. Mm -hmm. I mean, talk about that a little bit. Yeah. You know, you were the son of, yeah. of the king. Uh, that's a lot of pressure in and of itself, whether you want to race or not. And here you were now as a father with Adam, Adam expressing interest in wanting to be a racer. But of course, then you're in that dilemma. Am I pushing him? Is it for me or is it for him? Exactly. Yeah. You know, and I, I think I, I'm, I was very blessed and I, I've said this a thousand times to a thousand people through all my years. Um, we grew up in rural North Carolina. I mean, you know where Level Cross North Carolina yeah. is. And it, it's, it, we, all my neighbors were tobacco farmers and dairy farmers, uh, chicken farmers. They were just farmers. And the people that lived in the huge city of Randleman that was about 1,800 people, um, most of the people that lived in Randleman, they were mill workers. They worked in, in the textile industry. So we living in the country, we, I tell people, we lived on a farm too. We just happened to raise race cars, but there were <laughs> multiple, third, yeah, there were multiple third generation, fourth generation farms. You just followed what your dad did. But in a lot of ways, you were allowed to not follow what your dad did. The kids down the street, they didn't have to be farmers. They became farmers because that's what they loved. That's what they saw. They loved working the land. They loved being there. Yeah, it was hard. Man, the crops would fail. Something would come through and, and kill a chicken house full of chickens or tobacco prices would go down. But they didn't give up. They, they didn't stop. And I, I've said this. I was blessed in the sense that my granddad, Lee, allowed my dad to be who he was. My dad allowed me to be who I was. 
and I wanted to allow my kids to be who they were, uh, to experience things and, and to be who they were and figure out who they were. And I, I, I will say it, and I've said it in, in countless interviews. If you could set my granddad here today, and you guys could ask him five questions, and then you set my dad in the same thing, and you ask him the same five, and then I walked in the room, and you asked me the same five, and then Adam was the last one, and you asked him, you would conclude that those four guys don't even know each other. Uh, they didn't grow <laughs> up. They, didn't, they don't know anything about each other. Because we were allowed to to push those boundaries and to understand that. Um, and, and you've seen it. I know you've seen it, Hermie, with, with parents who push their kids and they want them to be the next Jeff Gordon or Jimmy Johnson or Dale Earnhardt. And, and that's not necessarily what the kid wants, but he loves his parents so much. That's what he does. So that, that, that was the context. I, if, if, if Adam didn't want to, then that's good. You know, Austin didn't want to. I love Austin to death. Uh, and Montgomery Lee, Racing was the farthest thing from her mind. She went to Tennessee. Mm -hmm. She didn't. She wanted to get away from this stuff, you know. And then I have three little boys now, so it's it's just find what you have a passion for. I uh, different in some ways, but similar, I guess. You know, I have three daughters. Been blessed with three three daughters. My oldest daughter, Cora, who just got married this past weekend, uh, she you know grew up playing a little bit of ball, but mostly it was about cheer for her. She was cheer. She was good at it. She ended up, you know, later in college cheering at UNC and cheered in two national championship basketball games. But I was gone all the time when they were growing up. You know all about that. But I was determined that one of my daughters was going to race. I just, you know, and I was in the go-kart business. I still build and sell go-karts now. So I went to her. Cora at this time was probably 12 years old. Probably, it sounds funny to say this, but a little bit too old, really, in karting terms to get started. Yeah. But I said... I told my wife, I said, I just really want her to, to, to see if she likes it. So finally she agreed. Cora says, okay. So uh, we put a cart together for her, put an engine on it, put a, put the seat together, did all that. And this is, you know, she's 25. So, you know, 12, 13 years ago. So we were going to Margaretsville Speedway, a little dirt track, about 30 miles from, from my house in Emporia. And we went down for the day, set it up, and we had her going. She went right on the racetrack. And it was four or five other guys there testing she went right up there on the racetrack, wide open, didn't know any better, wide open, flying, and ran really consistent laps. She held the wheel straight, all the things you want in an accomplished kart racer, and just flew. And so she went back out a couple of times. I mean, ne I mean, could not have gone any better. And But we got in the car, driving back home after that, and we talked a little bit, small talk, but nothing even about karting or the track or anything. So we got home and my wife says, how'd it go? I said, Angie, she really did great. You know, she, well, she says, what are you going to do now? I said, well, as much as I'd like to go talk to her about it more about when we're going to go again, I really think I need to wait for her to come to me to say, dad, can we go do it again? And I'm 52 years old and it's 13 years later and she never brought it up again. And yeah. I just didn't go there. I just didn't. You know, so I ended up on my weekends off for going to cheer competitions in Ohio and Florida and all these things. But I, I just knew I didn't want her to do things or do that for me. And I thought she didn't, she didn't come after me about it. And I thought if I put pressure on it, that's, she'd be doing it for me to your point. So you, you know, you gotta let your kids go, great you know, point. Yeah, that's a great point. I, there's a story in there I, I tell too, and I, I'll mention it real quick. So Adam did the go-kart stuff and he kept wanting, uh, he wanted better stuff. And I'm like, you can't drive. You don't need better stuff. Learn to drive first. Just so he finally wins. But anyhow, we bought a late model car when he was 14. Uh, and, and I had a little place renting a little shop that I did some motorcycle stuff in. So we'd go over there and work on it when he'd get out of school when he was 14. We worked and we worked, we worked for, I don't know, two or three months, whatever it is. And then he kept, he started coming up with excuses on why, why he didn't, why well, he wasn't working. So after about five or six months, one day he asked me, he said, how's that car coming along? And I said, I don't know. I don't work on your car. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, I, I, I don't work on your car. I worked on my dad's car, but I don't work on your car. If you want to get that car ready, I'll go over there and work on it with you, but I'm not going to work on your car and give you a car. And it took about a month and it flipped. 
And that kid was so focused. But that was his moment. Mm -hmm. That was that moment that he could have walked away mm -hmm. and that would have been fine. And that would have been fine with me um, and, and could have walked away and, and, and done something else. But that was the moment that he clicked for him. Um, and, and like I say, with Austin, never, never, never wanted to. Never wanted to do anything. Just he liked going. He liked being with his brother. But the driving part, he didn't like. I, uh, I wish I could sit here and talk to you for two hours about Adam, but I don't... I, I don't know how you I've told you many times when, when, when together, I mean, as strong as you are, I don't, to me, it's just heartbreaking. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't want to put you through all that, you know, yeah, some of that no, stuff no. again, but um, was this book kind of therapeutic for you in some ways to, yes. to put your feelings actually on paper? Cause in all the 25 years and especially after Adam's wreck, I never ask you about it. I send you a text or give you a call on special days and all that. But I, as much as I was curious about him, I just didn't want to, I just didn't want to go there. But to me, it, you know, when I started reading the book and it kind of made me feel like that you, I'm not saying you never talked about it, but maybe this gave you an, an avenue to kind of get some of it out there. Yeah, it was, it was, it was very healing. Um, and I didn't know I needed to be healed. That, that is, that's the part that came from it to me. Um, I thought I had dealt with everything. Um, you know, it was, it was 20 years ago, almost to the day that I started writing this thing that, that Adam's accident happened. Um, and, and I've said it before, you know, I, I thought time would take care of everything. Time has knocked the sharp edges off of May 12th, the day his accident happened, off of July 10th, his birthday, off of special holidays. It knocked those sharp edges off, but it still hurt. Um, we, we spoke about Faulkner earlier on some stuff and he could go to some dark places oh, yeah. and, and to revisit this was a very, very dark place for me. And it took me to a dark place. You just walk down and I've said it, you walk down that long hallway in your soul and there's a door and you open that door and there's a box marked Adam and you pull the top off that box and you're looking at yesterday. It, it just happened. It's not 20 years ago. Yeah. It just happened. And things I thought I had looked at, things I thought I had dealt with, things I thought I had made peace with, I hadn't. I hadn't. Um, and, I, and I didn't know it. I, I didn't know it. And that, that was, it, it shocked me. It hurt me. Um, it crushed me in so many ways. There, there were days I would come up and write two sentences and then lay down on the couch and not write anything for the rest of the day. Uh, and, and it took, thank goodness, Morgan and, and Overton, who was a little over two years old at the time, and Cotton was coming along, you had something and, and a focus of joy to kind of bring you back out of that. So, um, but in the end, as you got to a point, then it began to say, okay, I'm good with this. I'm good with it. And, and writing it was hard. But I, I'm, I'm going to tell you the hardest thing about all of this was when we did the audio book. Mm. And you have to go and stand and say it. Writing it and reading it in your head and seeing it is one thing. But when the words come out and they're out there forever and you say it, um, it's, it's tough, man. It, it, it was really tough. It took me probably two and a half, almost three weeks. There were days again that I would read this stuff and I could only read it for about 10 or 15 minutes. We'd have the whole studio blocked, you know, for four or five hours. And I'd read for 10 or 15 minutes and I'd say, I'll see you guys tomorrow if I feel like it, um, and I'll come back. And I'd just walk out because I just couldn't go on. I would just, I would break down and just start crying. There's probably more tape of me crying than there is reading, honestly, during some of these passages. And I laugh about it now, but at the time, um, it was, it, it, it shattered me for, for a number of months. Um, so to see it out now and to be able to talk about it, I'm in a lot better place. Um, so it has been my own, own form of therapy. Well, now that you're talking about that and, and then upon reflection of reading it, um, you can tell because ultimately the way you don't focus on Adam in one chapter, he's there in every chapter in some way, even when you're talking about growing up petty, uh, he's there in, in a certain yeah. way. And so it's an amazing tribute. Um, a lot of times we can overdo a tribute to somebody because they mean so much to us. They're connected to our soul. Um, you know, I pay tribute to my father every day because he's still in my head. He may be gone. He died a month after I graduated from college, but I can hear what he says. I repeat his sayings and phrases to my children. 
Uh, he was instrumental in my life. And that's how I pay tribute to him in what I do. You know, I've told Hermie this, you know, I, I went to my dad one time and I said, dad, you know, I want to be great at uh, just one thing. I want the Lord to give me one great thing that I can do in that way. But I've learned you can't change the world. And he said to me, son, if you can do one great thing and you change someone's life, you've changed the world because you've changed their world. Right. That's what I carry with me. But, but you have carried this on in a way, and, you know, and, and Hermie talks about therapy in writing the book. Um, but it's such a wonderful, beautiful living tribute uh, to your son. And, and of course, this book and the way it flows uh, and, and how then the foundation came about, uh, how a Victory Junction came about as a living, breathing uh, homage and tribute to your son as well. I mean, that was an amazing thing that you came to, uh, to, to make a difference in so many people's lives by something that your son suggested. Talk a little bit about how Victory Junction I got it start. I don't want to ruin, you know, I could talk about every little thing in yeah. this book and I probably will if we have enough time <laughs> and the computer doesn't kick out on us. But talk to us a little bit about Victory Junction, how it came about, if you haven't read the book, so people know, and how yeah. it's a living, breathing example of what your son lived for in his short time here on this good, good earth. Yeah, it, you know, we, we, were, we were fortunate, Adam and I, I was fortunate, I ride motorcycles. Uh, and I love motorcycles. I, I have a passion for riding motorcycles and just always have. My dad got me my first, Her Hermie got go-karts, okay? So I will say this, Hermie. My dad would not buy us a go-kart, okay? Would not. He kept telling us, go-karts will get you hurt. So he yep. bought us a motorcycle when I was five. <laughs> when I was five years old, he bought me a motorcycle. Don't get on four wheels, like, get on two wheels. <laughs> get on two. And here was his reasoning. His reasoning was... That when you think you know what you're doing, that motorcycle will put you on the ground and teach you respect for speed mm -hmm. and the talent it takes to ride it. And and that's so I just grew up on motorcycles. But Adam and I had been to Daytona uh, for Bike Toberfest, and we went over to Boggy Creek, uh, which is a sister camp to to Victory Junction, and it's part of Paul Newman's. At the time, it was the Hole in the Wall Gang group of camps. Now it's called Serious Fun Camps. Um, and when we left there, we were blown away blown away at the kids, by the kids, blown away uh, just by the, the activities and what these kids could do and what they were allowed to do. And then the secondary thing was, oh, yes, that child has, you know, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. Oh, yes, that child has cancer. Oh, yes, that child has Crohn's. These were serious diseases. This kid, just child has full-blown blown AIDS. So these are serious illnesses, but you didn't see that. You didn't see the illness. You saw the child. Um, and, and as we rode back, Adam, and we talked about it that night, Adam's like, man, we need, to, we need to build a camp like that. You guys already do that motorcycle ride, man. Let's just take the money and spin it into that. And as, as always, you just go back to racing. And you think about things like that. And, and we talked about it again. Uh, but then the next thing you know, Adam's not with us anymore. And the, the first thing that pops into mind is, let's build a camp. That's, that was something that was in his wheelhouse that he had thought about. And I called Paul uh, because I had been very blessed to, to, to drive a few sports car races with him. And, and Hermie, you'll like this. And he, so he sends his guys down and he says, I'll send my guys to talk to you about it. And I said, OK. So he sends his guys down and we sit in the back office there at the race shop and we tell these guys what we're going to do. And, you know, we're going to build this building. It's going to look like a race car and we're going to build this building. It's going to be the body shop, but it's really going to be a hospital because that's the kind of thing a, a camp is. And they said, well, can you give us a few minutes? And they, we did. And um, they, they came back and got us. And they said, we don't think that we want to be associated with this camp um, because we just, we just don't think it, it'll work. We think it'll fail. Um, and we don't want to put Paul's name or ha have Paul associated with anything. So we're going to pass. And we're sitting there. And, and they said, well, what do, you, what do you guys think you might do now? And we said, build a camp. <laughs> and, and they kind of looked at it. You know, and they kind of looked at us. And, and and the, the comeback was, we raise millions of dollars to ride around in a circle, to ride around in a circle. What makes you think we can't raise money to do good for other people? And that's the way we approached it, because we just always felt like that if you were doing good, you could do it. You could do it. I mean, you, it was a good cause. You could do it. And, you know, Bobby Labonte and Dale Jarrett, so many people jumped on early on. And, and Paul called me that night. I will say this. Paul called that night and he said, what did my guys say? I said, they said you were out. And Paul said, well, 
they may be out, but I'm oh, in. Oh, awesome. Yeah. And, and Paul sent us a check and got it started. So, I mean, it was just cool. The, just the way the camp came about. And here's the fascinating part. 2004, we opened the gates. It's 2022. We have touched the lives of over 90,000 kids. Um, wow. And, and on camp, I think we've seen 35 or 40,000 kids at camp. But we go to hospitals and we take camp to the hospitals. We call it camp in a box. We'll do archery inside the hospital with, with different things and stuff. Um, but it is amazing. And, and I go back to, a, to, to what you said a minute ago. It, you only have to change one life. You know, God doesn't ask you to change the world. He just asks you to touch a life, to, to touch someone and change them in a different direction. And I tell people all the time, when I leave camp and I see the, those smiles, I know Adam's still here. Um, so it's incredibly, it's incredibly healing for me. But I don't believe that I've ever touched these kids' lives the way they touch my life. Uh, they're the ones that are life changers, not, not me. You know what I mean? Not the race fans. Not the, the race fans are the people who have made this place happen. You know, you drove a car with Victory, a truck with Victory yeah. Junction. You've been a huge supporter. So many people have done that. Um, and it's amazing how these kids pay us back. Um, uh, and they, they don't even know they're paying us back. They pay us back by coming to camp mm -hmm. and playing ball, by coming to camp and catching a fish for the first time, by coming to camp, uh, and doing artwork and doing their stuff and by coming to camp and making friends. Um, so many of these kids, we had a little boy, I'm going to take one minute. We had a little boy that came from Ohio and he was, was here at, at camp and he went to, um, the world 600, the Coca-Cola 600. And I took him to drive introduction and he had an illness that was very visual. Um, but he, it was a rare illness. I, I will say that it's a rare illness and I don't want to get into that part of it, but, but he walked across stage with me, uh, at Charlotte at the 600. Um, and a family in Ohio saw this little boy and their little boy had the exact same illness and their little boy had never seen another child that looked like him until that little boy walked across the stage. The next year, the little boy from came, came to camp and the two kids have hooked up. And since that time, since that time, they've gone to Disney World two or three times together. They've vacationed at Myrtle Beach two or three times together. They've become friends. And there are two kids that met because of camp, because of racing, because of what this sport has done uh, and because of Adam. Yeah. And that's two lives that were changed for the good, um, that no matter what happens in the rest of the world, um, it touched somebody. And that, that's always, to me, that's always, and there are amazing. stories like that in the book, uh, when you read it, Hermie, um, that since I've read it cover to cover, there's a story in there about a, a young man that didn't want to participate, but then all of a sudden, um, yeah. it changed, there was a change and it changed his life because of the, ter the determination of you and those members and the counselors, uh, of the camp that, you know, you're not going to give up on yourself and we're not giving up on you. And, and it's a really inspirational story about the camp all the way through. And you know, it's, the, it's the, great. the coolest thing about Adam to me is, you know, I was a little bit ahead, never really raced against him a few times, you know, not, but yeah, he was one and I, I, Dale Jr. was some like this too, in a way, but you think a kid coming along with that last name that had some of the opportunities he had that he would carry himself in a, an entitled manner. And Adam was the furthest thing away from that. He spoke to me, other people, fans, strangers. He legitimately, to me, came across as somebody who really appreciated the opportunity that he was given, took nothing for granted, and and didn't, you know, I'm not, of course he knew he was a petty, but he didn't, he didn't, yeah. he didn't carry himself that way. You, you know, and to me, that's got to be a tribute to you and your family. Yeah, th listen, that's, that's, uh, that all came from my mom. Um, yeah. <laughs> we were always from Level Cross and we were always going to be from Level Cross. And that's the way it is, no matter, it, it didn't make any difference. But, um, and I, I think that's, that's rural America, yeah. man. I, to me, that, that's what it is. My dad can still to this day go to Randleman and he's just Richard. Mm -hmm. I go back, I'm just Kyle. There, there, there is no last name. But I, I want to say one last thing on, on the camp with these kids and, and this stuff. I have determined, Hermie, through all these years, through all these years, that these kids that go through, through camp, these kids that go through these medical procedures and, and the things that they fight and the obstacles in front of them, 
that they have that racer's mentality where they never stop. Mm -hmm. They never stop. They never give up. They never look back. There's always a better day coming. They may be mad one day. Don't get me wrong, but there's a better day tomorrow. And, and that's the way racers are. You always, you wreck on Sunday, we'll get them next mm -hmm. Sunday. You know, your sponsor goes away, we'll just go find another one. It's not going to be easy, but we'll go find another. They never just stop. And that is the one thing that I think we can all take from, from, from these kids. They're so special. They just never, ever give up. There's never an obstacle that they think they can't. I tell everybody about every day, you know, on a completely different level, um, you know, you're talking about Adam and through Adam, all these kids with camp, how they give you perspective. And Bill knows this now, you know, uh, of all the problems that I think I've got, look, my race, my racing career was not what I wanted it to be. Uh, I had fun doing TV, but I was gone a lot. This, that, But every time, you know, you wake up thinking I've got, you know, all the things that are problems for me and my middle daughter is autistic. As you know, Haley Drew, she's like the most angelic thing in the whole wide world. She walks in my room every morning at six o'clock, ready to, to, to get in the shower and get her clothes on and go do her chores at work. She loves everybody. She doesn't know race. She doesn't know discrimination. She doesn't know hate. She hugs everybody. I mean, just she, I, I, and I, and, and I get embarrassed sometimes I wake up and say, Hermie, what the hell is wrong with you? Why are you worried about these A, B's? Look at this child. She is gets, you know, got, got a whole right. different perspective. And, you know, sometimes we get those things from, you know, from areas that, that we don't truly, I mean, I went for, you know, Haley's 25 now. And I like for 15 years, I, I, I bogged myself down in life saying, why did the good Lord do this to my child? And now for the last 10 years, I'm like, I am so thankful the good Lord put this child in my life right. because she lifts everybody up. It's just, you know, when you choose to look for the positives, like you have, you know, eventually with this stuff, it, it surely, you know, your own perspective can make a hell of a difference. Yes, it can. Yes, it can. And listen, that's why, that's why no matter what we do, you know, and, and my grandmother, my grandmother ones, I, I talk about my grandmother ones a lot, some in the book, mm -hmm. uh, because she lost her son, Randy. Um, but, but she always chose to have a caring, giving heart. And in some strange way, it's that child's heart. You, you got to keep a piece of your heart. It's always got to be that child that's open to wonder, that's open to, to new things, that's open to excitement and doesn't experience that, that hate, that doesn't experience uh, that colorblind or that, that are colorblind. They don't see race, creed, color, sexual orientation. They see none of that. They just see what's in your eyes. Um, and that, that is what is so cool about the kids at yep. camp. Uh, to me, you know, that, that, that is just, that's the most special thing that is, that is, that yeah. you are very, very blessed to have Haley. Uh, and quite honestly, I'm glad it quite honestly, it took me a while to, to figure that out, you know, and, yep. uh, once I did, it's been smooth sailing, you know? Yeah, you know, that's, I think we're all that way. We get blessed, but we just don't know it. it. Takes us a while to figure it out that that was the plan. And oh, I see yeah. what we're supposed look, to be. I got it. Uh, you you mentioned your dad a, a couple times. I, I want to make two comment, uh, two questions uh, related to your dad. First of all, what has he said to you about uh, having more grandkids at his age and you kids at your age? Has he? What is his? <laughs> I can only imagine. Uh, you know, think yeah. some of the comments he's maybe made, but I want to hear them. So, so, okay. So you got to get that. You got to understand how my dad is. Number one, he's 85. Okay. Yep. He's 85. Okay. So he read my book also. And, and the, his first comment and he enjoyed it. Eventually we got around to what really mattered, but his yeah. first comment was, you should have let me read it first and I would have corrected all the mistakes. Okay. Yeah. So that's the, that's, the, <laughs> that's what you get from your dad. You know what I mean? Yep. Yeah. He's, he's going to set you straight. Here's Here's the funny part about my dad is, is, is that th with the kids. So I have nieces um, and, and, and listen, I've got grandkids that are close to the same age as my kids. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I've got, I've got grandkids that are, are, are my nieces and nephews have children that are younger or the same age. So my dad at 85 
can't figure out which ones are grandkids, <laughs> which ones are great, kids, and how they all flow together. And and so we were at Christmas. This this is fascinating. I I, I want to tell you this. Nineteen what nineteen ninety two when my dad retired. Okay, nineteen ninety three. Right. We had a photo taken at at my dad's house, um, and it was my mom and dad and all of us and all of our kids. Okay, and and the, we took the race car, put it in front of his house. We all put on Richard Petty fan appreciation tour t shirts. You know, uh, still selling, always yeah, selling, yeah. man, always selling, hustling t shirt. So we had this photo taken, and there were eighteen of us, eighteen of us in front of front of this car. You know, around this car and in front of the house. So this past Christmas, um, as COVID began to to become a thing that we could all get back together, he wanted everybody to come. And we wheeled that 92 Pontiac over there the, to the house again, parked it in exactly the same place, and we all gathered around it. Um, and Adam wasn't there. My mom's not there anymore. But there were 42 of us wow. this time. 40, 42 <laughs> of us. And, 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 that mean, and, and that to him is the greatest picture that he's ever had. Mm -hmm. Now, he can't tell you whether they're grandkids or great-grandkids. I will say <laughs> yeah. that. But that's, that's his legacy. And he, he says that he's like, when I'm gone, this, you're what people will remember about mm -hmm. me, you know, about me. Yeah. They'll remember I won a few races or I won a championship or two. And that's the way it was. And this is what I did. But in the end, you are, you and your sisters and the grandkids and the great grandkids, that's how, how he wants to be remembered. And that, that was a pretty cool moment. Last question. Uh, another question about your dad. Well, I one, got a question. One of the things, yeah, but just one minute. <laughs> I haven't talked to Kyle in a while. Stand by. Clearly. I um, feel like I'm in on a phone call. Something, <laughs> something that I've always. I'm eavesdropping here. I'm sorry. Something that I've always wondered, but never asked. And one thing that's a pet peeve of mine. And I got to tell you, my brother does this over the years too. This irritated me. Signing autographs. Drivers, a lot of them would run by and sign autographs. My brother did it. And there's no way in hell that person, when they scribbled it on the book or on the shirt or the hat, the time they got home, they would know who it was because it's kind of one of these running little scribbles, but you and your dad both have the best, most complete detailed signatures in all of NASCAR. And so, and your dad, I very see it, see him do a walking when he signs an autograph. Most time he's going to stop and give that person his attention, but also, but you guys both sign and it's all the details with the dot and the, you know, all the, all cross the T's, right? Yep. Is that something that you got from him or what started it from him yes. or whatever? Because yep. every Richard Petty and every Kyle Petty autograph I have, it's unmistakable. And a lot of guys, to me, if you're going to take time to sign an autograph, take time to sign an autograph. And you and your dad yeah. done that. So what's the history of that? It's got to be something. Yeah. Here, here's a little bit of the history. Here's a little bit of the history. My granddad was the same way. If you saw, ever saw my granddad's name, you, you could read it perfect. So my, grand, my dad said that when he first started, um, that he was just so excited to be a race mm -hmm. car driver. And nobody, working for my granddad, nobody had ever asked him for an autograph. Um, but he was just so excited to be a race car driver that he was bound and determined that when someone come up, um, they had bought a ticket. So he was going to repay them by giving them something that they could look at and say, I met that guy one time. I know who that guy is. You, you know what I mean? So he practiced, I mean, he worked on it. He practiced hard to, to figure out what it was, uh, to get it. Now, at the same time, a lot of his first races, and he will be very clear on this, there were only five or 600 people in the grandstands and only about six of them wanted his <laughs> autograph. So it sounded good at the time, okay? <laughs> Fast forward to 92 when there's 100,000 people in the grandstand, it's not as good an idea as what you thought right, it was right. 50 or 60 years ago. But when I came along, Here's the way it was. Here's the way racing was explained to me. And I, I try, I've tried to explain it to people. I explained it to Adam this way is it's a circle. I want to drive a race car. I need money. So I look for a sponsor. The sponsor needs to sell products. Okay. So who buys the products? The fans. Fans buy the products so I can drive the race car. So they spend the money. I help them sell the product. Fans buy. And it just goes around mm -hmm. in a circle. 
So if you're nice to the fans, you're going to have a ride. That's how simple yeah. it was. That was that was his mentality. If you are nice to the fans. The other thing that Richard Petty is, and I will go to my grave saying that when he gets to heaven, what what St. Peter is going to say is, here comes the world's biggest race fan, because that's what he was. He was just a race fan. From the time he went to that first race at 13 years old and watched his dad race, and then watched Buck Baker and Joe Weatherly and the Flock Brothers and all those guys that came along in the 50s, he was just a race fan. Uh, he just happened to be a race fan that got to drive race cars. And that's kind of the way I grew up, too. And, and you know, I see guys, I see, I, I, and you, I know you do it. People will come up and they'll hand you a book and it'll have 15 autographs on it. And I can't make out any None of them. I, 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 don't, I don't know who they are. You know, and you get them on Twitter. Do you, does anybody know whose autograph this is? No idea. And um, so I, he always looked at it mm-hmm. that way. You know, that that was something, if a fan wanted something from you, you should give them a piece mm-hmm. of you and not just a mark on a piece of paper. You should give them a piece of you. Um, and that's kind of the way we've always looked at it and always approached it. And, um, you know, to this day, I, I, I quit signing numbers. I'll, I'll say that. You know, when I first started, I put 42. Um, then I went to Felix and I put 42 and uh, drove my own car and I put 44. But when I started driving Adam's car, that was his number. So you can tell an autograph from Kyle Petty um, from the time – after Adam's accident for the last 20 years, I've never put a number beside my name um, because that was Adam's number. I always, I don't go back to my 42 or back to my 44 because they weren't my numbers anymore. They were somebody else's. So yeah, I have, uh, I've been writing down questions while I'm listening. You get one, you get one, then I get two more. Then we got, he's he's got, he's got 14 kids to, Ten two tonight. I, I, I get it. You're good, man. You're good. <laughs> well, my, I told you it's your night. Your night. Man. Awesome. We're going to be here all night. <laughs> this is going to be a marathon. Uh, so I, I was remembering how I wanted my room colored petty blue, and there's a story about how petty blue came about in the book. I'm not going to spoil it, but my dad went to Sherwin Williams, and and this guy, you know, I mean, you couldn't find petty blue on a card for an interior, you know, painting for a guy's room, and there was this one guy at Sherwin Williams that said, "I can make it," and he got pretty close. And then, you know, then I found yeah. out actually how it was made. Uh, but, but one thing I read in the book that, that kind of struck me, and I don't think you went into it as much, and I, I don't know if well, I'm asking something that we don't go too deep into. But ultimately, you know, you were part of Petty Enterprises, then you left. You went to the Wood Brothers, Felix yeah. Abadis. You know, you had success. I mean, driving for the Wood Brothers, that's so awesome. And I remember that. And then he came back, and, you know, you were the CEO and left for a while, and came back. And at some point, Petty Enterprises was sold. And, and you mentioned yes. it a little bit in the book that you weren't a part of that, that suddenly you were not a part of Petty Enterprises, your family business. And it, it just, it felt like, and, and believe me, a lot from your words can be felt on how you're feeling, but it just felt like, you know, you weren't happy about that. That felt like that there wasn't either closure yeah. or you didn't like how that went down. I mean, if you, if you feel like just kind of telling us how that came about yeah. and how it made you feel, I mean, that, that to me was really just if I had an unanswered question that seemed like I wanted to know more from the book, it was how you were feeling, how that came about. And, and that must've been tough. That's in volume two. Uh, all right. okay. <laughs> so you got to buy the next, you gotta buy the next book. Will that be a long sentence? <laughs> That's going to be one heck of a sentence. Okay. I'm kidding. <laughs> so here, honestly, here's what happened. I, and I touch on part of this in the, in the book a little bit, like you say. So I drove for, for, I started driving at Petty Enterprises. Um, and, and this is one thing that a lot of people don't remember is we were Chrysler, we were Plymouth, we were Dodge. Um, but man, Dodge didn't have a car. When they came out with that Dodge Magnum in, in the late 70s, that was not much of a race car. I won the Arca race with it, but that's about the only thing it ever did. Uh, so we went to Chevy. We, we switched to the GM products. And we had fallen on a couple of hard years. And my dad was a little bit older. Um, you know, he, 40, what would he have been at that time? 43, 44, right along in there. And um, STP took some of the, had pulled back their money. If you go back to the Daytona 500 that he won in 79 with the big wreck, it's not got an STP on the hood and the quarter panels. It's got a couple of STPs on it, but it's not an STP car as I grew up with. And as I've most never, people, I've most never paid attention to that. Yeah. Yeah. You assume. Yeah. Most people, yeah. that's right. Most people just assume it. But that was hard times. But we won those races. And we were back in the game for a little bit, for at least a couple of years. Uh, I left Petty Enterprises because we were about to fall out of the game again. And, and my dad, we sat down and talked about it. And he said, one of us has got to go. 
and you, you're not good enough to get another job, so I'm going to go. And, and he left me at Petty Enterprises. Um, and I ran it for a year or so and then had the opportunity to go to the Wood Brothers. And he said, you got to go there. You got to go there. And we kept Petty Enterprise open uh, and run Dick Brooks. And we run some races out of it just to keep, keep the legacy alive and keep it going. And then my dad came back. But I went to Felix, like you said. I left Felix specifically and for the only reason is because I felt like I needed to give Adam a place because my granddad gave my dad a place. My dad gave me a place to start. I had to give Adam a place to start. And that's the only reason I started my own team. Uh, and then I came back. And I came back and I brought all my stuff back to Petty Enterprise eventually in like 99, 2000, right along in there. And then when my dad sold the place, he just sold it. And it was his place to sell. It was his place to sell. And, and but I was hurt. I was PO'd um, because I had brought my team back and put it in with your team. And you're not even acknowledging that I gave you anything for that team. You know what I mean? And as far as I was concerned, I was going to drive a race car. And at some point in time, I was going to own a race team. And this is what we were going to do. Um, and you realize at that point in time, that's not going to happen. And, and it's not. And, and this, is the, this is the part that people struggle with. Okay. So I will, I will say this that this is the part that people struggle with. Well, were you mad at your dad? I was never mad at my dad. I was mad at my dad, the business guy, but not at my dad. Not at my dad. There's a huge, you got to understand that I grew up as Richard Petty's son. And then I worked at the shop. So I worked for Richard Petty. Then I was part of Richard Petty's pit crew. I carried tires. I hung bodies. I was a mechanic. Um, I worked on his car. I was part of his team. And then one day I woke up and I was Richard Petty's teammate. And I got to drive right along Richard, side Richard Petty in, in a Petty Enterprises car. And then I left and I was a competitor to Richard Petty. And I started my own team and I was an owner that was a competitor of Richard Petty's. You know what I mean? And then I come back and we're business partners. And then we're back to being father and son again. So I've, I dealt with Richard Petty in so many different ways and from so many different angles that some kooky way I could separate that in my head that the guy that sold the race team was Richard Petty, the businessman mm -hmm. that I was mad at but Richard Petty, my father, I was never mad at. I love him more today than I've ever loved him and loved him then that, that was never an issue. So people wanted to put that in there that that was like, man, you gotta be mad at him. You're not speaking to him. We never didn't, did not mm -hmm. talk. I to the day my mom passed away. I called my mom. It's a Southern thing. I called my mom every day to check in just to see how she was and how life was going. Um, but yeah, I, I was hurt. I was more hurt than I was anything. Um, and that was something in this book that I just wasn't ready to go into. Okay. Uh, like I said, I was going to be as honest at 60 as I was going to be, and that's about as honest as I could be right What now. was your, you know, obviously a couple of weeks back, uh, Eric Jones went back to yeah. Victory Lane in Darlington <laughs> and... I choose to look at the positive side of things. Any any connection with Petty, Richard Petty, Petty Enterprises, getting back to Victory Lane at a place like Darlington is great. But then some people are going to say, well, it's really not Petty anymore, this, that, and the other. You know, congratulations, first of all, I don't give a damn what nobody says, yeah. to win a race with the, with the size of that team compared to some they're racing against and yeah. all this other things. It's a hell of an accomplishment. But how did you view... Um, the petty car or petty affiliated car going back to uh, victory lane. And, and what did your dad think about it? Uh, man, he was ecstatic. Uh, I talked to my sister earlier and, and we were talking about that same thing earlier this evening. And she said he still hadn't come down from it. Um, no. You can just hear it in his voice. You, you know what I mean? You can, you can just hear it. And, and, and I, I look at it different than my sisters look at it. And I, I will say that is Petty Enterprises was started. Um, Petty Enterprises was started in, in 1946, 47, right along that. My, my granddad was racing and had run a few races before NASCAR ever came about uh, because there, were, there was stuff. But Petty Enterprises as a company was started uh, back that long ago. We raced until 2006 or 7 out of Level Cross. That was Petty Enterprises. They moved to Charlotte. And that was no longer Petty Enterprises. Then it became Richard Petty Motorsports, Gillette Everham, Richard Petty, whatever it. And it's always had that tie and that association. 
but there's no longer it's no longer Richard mm -hmm. Petty or it's no longer Petty Enterprise. You can't in in the classic six degrees of separation almost, you can't connect what is Petty Enterprise what is Petty Motorsports now and Petty GMS to Lee Petty or or to anybody. It, there's, it's, that chain's been broken. But having said that, the forty three is Petty through and through. The forty three will be Richard Petty forever and ever till the end of time in this sport. You know, it's it's a it's a funny thing how people lock up on numbers. Mm -hmm. Um and, and you know, but but to so many people, just like the three to so many people will always be Earnhardt. To me, the three is Cotton Owens, because that's who I grew <laughs> yeah. up with. Buddy Baker drove the three car. See uh uh, uh, uh they, uh, Richard Childress drove the three car. Earnhardt made it famous. But it was already in my heart. It had already been tattooed, man. That's the way it was. But to so many people, that 43 still continues to be tattooed in their soul with Petty beside of it in some way, shape, or form. It may not be Petty Enterprises. It may be Gillette Petty Motorsports. It may be RPM Richard Petty Motorsports. It may be Petty GMS. But there's a Petty somewhere beside that. So I was extremely happy, just like I am. Listen, when that Wood Brothers car and that 21 goes to victory lane or comes close, yeah. man, I, I, bleed that, I, I bleed that candy apple red and that pearl oh, white, yeah. man, and with those gold numbers. That, that's, I still love that thing more Pure than later. in the world, too. And, uh, yeah, that was, that's that it, was my man. dad's favorite, uh, favorite car, favorite team forever. Uh, so I was, uh, we were at um, Emerald Isle at Carteret Speedway. I was in the motor coach. Yeah, Bill's getting to it. We own an open wheel modified team together. <laughs> no, no. That Ryan Newman drove for us. We won the race coming back, the first race back at North Wilkesboro. He wants to offer you a ride in the car. Um, and, but I'm, I, but I'm, sounds a, like you just did. I'm, sounds I'm like Paul, you did it this time. I handle the uh, finances of Saddle Stanley Racing. I'm in charge of the podcast. That's yeah. why it's such a failure. <laughs> and uh, he's, he's, he's bringing home the checker flag and trophies. Uh, no, see, I, I might have gone there at the end. I was just going to ask him for a slight, look, he's got these kids and diaper, I was, but I was just going to ask him for a friendly family, slight discount to his asking price. That's all. Go ahead. Okay, that's fine. I mean, you can negotiate that. I'm not getting in the middle of that. I'm just wanting a commitment. Okay. But, but so we were, we're there. We got a motor coach. I take my family to the racetracks and, and we're sitting there watching and we don't have satellite TV. You have to, you know, do the digital. And as I was dozing off, came on the show with Kyle Petty. He's eating food and interviewing guests. And it, and all of a sudden I was like fascinated. And then, you know, I just started reading the book too. Just fascinating. This interview that he does. And, and I can't remember the title of the show, but I want to find out where I can find it. It was on some like works network or something. And it's him having in-depth conversations with people. They eat, they eat somewhere great. And then they drive around in a car. Yep. Tell us about your TV show so that I can go find it again. Cause I watched it and then couldn't find right. it again. And I kept, you know, there are like 72 channels that you can find on a guest on digital TV yeah. and I couldn't find it again. So tell us about that if you don't mind. Okay. This show uh, also came about during the pandemic. You know how, so I'm sitting at home during the pandemic, got nothing going on, got nothing trying to write a book. But really, you know, you're just you're bouncing off the walls. Um, and I'm thinking, man, I need a new TV show. I got to come up with something. So the name of this show is Dinner Drive. Dinner Drive. Dinner Drive is the name of I'm the show. I'm writing it down. And it's on the, <laughs> okay, and it's on the Circle Network. You can also see it on Peacock. They stream it on Peacock. Um, but it's on the Circle Network. Comes on on Thursday nights. They're re-airing the series right now, this, this year, this season. So... The premise of the show, uh, and, and, you know, we, we were talking about Rutledge and talking about people uh, before, and there's just so many car shows out there, so many hot rod shows, so many street rod shows, so many all this. So the premise is to make it a little bit about a car or about transportation, just the first segment, just the first segment. And, and the question is, what's your most sentimental car? Not what's your baddest to the bone car. Not what's your most expensive car. What is a car that as you were growing up today, what, whatever, that brings back memories for you, that, that brings back something that makes your heart feel warm because you say, man, I love that car more than anything. And that was the fascinating part. So I started calling people that I knew, 
You know what I mean? Calling people. I start going through my Rolodex first to get people. So, and I'll tell you this. I did Dale Jr. first because he lives up the road. He lives up the road. And um, I knew if we messed up the first one, he would let us film it again. <laughs> yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well. so Dale Jr., his, his most sentimental car is an 88 S10 pickup, a 1988 S10 pickup that his dad brought home from the dealership one day and said, here, drive this. And that's what he drove. And that was his most sentimental car. I did, the first year I did my dad, I did Junior, um, I did Mario Andretti, I did Herschel Kyle's, Walker. Uh, Kyle's uh, Rolodex is better than mine. Seriously. Yeah. Would you yeah. like to join a podcast? <laughs> I, did, I, did, I did Herschel yeah. Walker, I did um, Ric Flair, I did Davis Love III, um, I did Darius Rucker, and I did Pitbull. Um, and it was fascinating. Pitbull, okay? Mr. Worldwide owns a cup car now. And all this. His most sentimental car was a 1976 Ford Pinto. Wow. wow. Okay. Because his family came from Cuba. His parents came from Cuba. He lived in Miami um, and, 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 and the projects and no air conditioning. His mom would get him up in the middle of the night, him and his brothers and sisters, and ride him around with the windows down in the streets of Miami, listening to music and listening to Tony Robbins cassettes motivational cassettes that you can be something in life. You can do something um, to keep them cool and let them sleep so they could go to work, school the next day. That was his. Ric Flair's was a 65 Dodge Dart. You know what I mean? Um, Darius, Rucker, Darius Rucker's was an early 70s Carmen Ghia. So you start looking at Mario Andretti was a 1944. This, this story fascinated me. Mario Andretti was was lived in a part of, of Italy that after World War II became, I want to say it became Croatia, or it, came, it became another country. So they were displaced from his homeland where he was born and sent to a refugee camp in Tuscany, Italy. And he lived in a refugee camp in Tuscany, Italy for seven years behind a fence in a refugee camp. Know that. And the doctor that would, the doctor that would come to the refugee camp, the, 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 the adult males and some of the women would leave the camp every day and go to work, but they had to come back to the camp and check in. Um, but the car that came and brought the American doctor to their camp was a, 19, was a dark blue 1940 Ford, and he fell in love with that car. And when their family moved to America when he was 15, it was mid-50s, and his dad went and bought a 1940 dark blue Ford. Uh, because that was the car that they remembered and represented America to them. And, and you look at that, and that's such an incredible story. You know what I mean? That Mario Andretti came from a refugee camp to be Mario Andretti, and America meant so much to them. So then you sat down, and, and that's where you learn the story of the car and the story of who they are. So that, that's been cool. This year, this year, and I'll bust through this road. This year we did Daryl Hall. Um, That's who I saw. John Rich. You know, excuse me. John Oates. John Oates. I did John, John Oates. Didn't do Daryl. Did John Oates, John Rich. Um, golly, man, we did the Avett brothers, Lyle Lovett. Uh, I did Joe Gibbs, uh, Jeff Gordon, Daryl Walter. Daryl could be his own yeah. season. <laughs> um, I did Daryl. Um, and, and I did um, Scott Hamilton, the Olympic yeah. gold medalist, the, 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 the ice skater. And Sean Johnson, um, the, uh, the gymnast, Olympic gymnast. Yeah, yeah. So it, it, it's been just a wide, it's just people Sean that Johnson, I know. And Sean people Johnson is one of the very few people that I got to interview on my time on TV that I was taller than. One of the very few. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. But it, it's just been a lot of fun because through you learn, you learn so much about them just sitting down and having a meal. And we go to a place that they want to go, you know? So a lot of times it's just a local dive, you know what I mean? It's just, and which makes it even more fun. But it, it is, it has been extremely interesting to see. I, I think we all, and, and we can, we can all say this. You look at other people's lives and you think, man, they had it easy. They, they just breeze right and they're, they're superstars and they never had to do anything. You know what I mean? And then you start talking to these people and they've all overcome horrendous, just insurmountable obstacles to be who they are today. And, and you get that spirit from yeah. that. You know, you get that, you understand that. And that's been, 
it's been a fun, fun program to do. And I, I tell people all the time, and, and Hermie, you can appreciate this. I, I tell people this all the time. I get to write the questions and ask the questions I want to know. And if the people, and I tell people this all the time, if you don't like my questions, I don't care because they're my <laughs> questions and it's my show and I want to know there the answers go. to those there questions. Exactly how that's Hermie feels is. about his questions on the show. Yeah, that's exactly Dinner right, Drive that's Circle exactly right. Network, also on Peacock. Okay, and let yep. me tell you, it was great. And yep. it was uh, John Oates, and yep. he, he recounted his connection to racing as well, which was just a fascinating conversation. Yep. And I, for some reason, I think he went to a barbecue joint or something oh. like that. But Yeah, yeah, we did. We went to the Loveless, which is a place. But I got to tell you this, Hermie. John Oates, okay, you, you'll, how old are you, 52. Hermie? How old are Oates? Yeah. 52. So, yeah, okay, so John Oates, at the height of his career, um, in the early 80s, 82, 83, 84, 85, right along in there, had a factory IMSA Pontiac deal and was a factory driver for, for what? Pontiac. That's on the exactly IMSA right. Yep. Yes, yes, yes. And, and, and it's like people just didn't realize that. People didn't realize that he was that deep into racing and that he understood racing. He was doing it on the side and showing it up. Uh, and he's and he almost he, he had a really bad wreck and he kind of I believe that one, but he don't do not try to tell me that Ric Flair was a race car driver in a former life. <laughs> <laughs> Ric Flair was tremendous. That's all I all I have to say is he let me wear one of his robes. There you go. The conversation. Ric Flair was a stewardess on that, a that charter flight. That's what his <laughs> claim to fame was. Uh, but but yeah, and and he and he talks about even how. Uh, John Oates, how Hall and Oates came together. It's like he needed a place to stay or was yeah. staying at some guy's couch. And he and uh, Hall and Oates started playing and bang. What a great interview that was. And, and so my final question, although hopefully maybe you have a sentimental, you can do a show on, you know, your sentimental desire to be in an open wheel modified with the number 22 or 39 on the side, <laughs> riding around a smart tour, maybe another race. But you and Hermie can work that out. I want to tell you uh, how much this meant to me. And, and I wanted to communicate it if they haven't, but I know they have. I'm very close to the Wendell Scott family, uh, Warwick and Frank and, and Mabel and, uh, yes. and love them to death. And of course I watched the interview that you did with them on another coffee table show kind of thing that you did, but, uh, but they speak, uh, the petty praises when other people wouldn't give them a chance or not show them the equal respect, your father, your family, uh, demonstrated, uh, an enormous love and respect for that, for that family, even giving, you know, equipment to, to you all when, or to the to Wendell Scott when he raced and even a truck. I think they tell a story to me about yeah. how they got one of the petty haulers uh, back in the day that you guys went out of your way uh, to show love, admiration and respect to, to Wendell and his kids who are his pit crew members. And that meant so much to them. And he's one of my heroes, one of Danville, Virginia's heroes. And that meant a lot to me. So I wanted to thank you about that. And, and, and perhaps you reflect on that just a little bit here before Hermie takes over and asks the rest of his questions. <laughs> Yeah, so you know what it, it, it is that, and thank you, thank you, because they are they were a great family. Um, and I grew up. Listen, we grew up at a time when everybody parked in the infield. Everybody, you just pulled in the infield, you parked, you ate chicken and and country ham biscuits, and had a cooler full of Coca Cola and stuff. And everybody would park side by side. And more times than not, we would park beside Wendell and his family. Um, and my mom felt that she needed to be there with with Wendell. Uh, with Wendell's wife and with the kids, um, because you went into some some places where you know when you go back to sixty three or sixty four, sixty five, sixty six, sixty seven, and you're in the deep south, we can rewrite all the history we want to, but it was not the best place to be um, for for African Americans for Black families. Uh, and then you're going to a racetrack where it, it's just it was just probably worse. Um, but at the same time. My dad, if you talk to my dad and my granddad and those guys, they, I don't believe they ever saw Wendell's color. They just saw that he was a race car driver, just like Cecil Gordon, just like James Hilton, just like John Sears, just trying to make a living, trying to do something for his family the same way they wanted to. Uh, they just were, were trying to do it. And, and they kind of traveled together. They would meet up and, and travel a lot of times together um, because nobody would mess with Wendell and his crowd when there were more teams around and, 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 you know, um, Earl Bomber, um, and, and those Earl Brooks, uh, the, the, the Earl of Lynchburg yeah. up there, Earl Brooks did the same thing. He looked after Wendell, you know, and, and it's not that Wendell needed looking after. It was just, you needed a presence. You needed a presence back then. And, and Wendell, 
Wendell would come down this shop when I was a little boy, and, and it's funny you mentioned that truck. Because when I went to Danville and did the interview, they took me over in the truck sitting behind the old yeah, shop. Yeah, still got it. Uh, that they worked in. Yeah. And it's, it's sitting behind the old shop. Uh, I, man, I'd, I'd love to get that truck and restore it back to what it was. Because in 1966 and then in 1967, I've got two pictures um, and, um, that are special to me. Is... 66 is my first grade teacher and my first grade class. And we're standing beside that truck at my dad's race shop and a race car is sitting there with it. We went, we went on a show and tell and, and we went up to the race shop and, and just up there. And we stood beside that same truck that's sitting out beside Wendell's, Wendell's house. And when you look at my sister did the same thing in 67, she was a year behind me. So that is a truck that as you look through photos, from about 64 to about 60, well, probably the, probably 67, because we got a new truck in 68. Uh, and then my dad switched to Ford in 69, and we, we parked all that stuff. But <laughs> until 67, I think it was probably the last year, that truck shows up. Uh, I mean, it hauled, that truck hauled Daytona winners. Wow. Uh, that was the truck, man. That was the truck. And it was, and when he was through with it and Wendell needed a truck, then they gave it to Wendell, and Wendell took it and, and used it until he finished his career in the early 70s. Um, but there's a lot of connection and, there um, because there was a lot of respect there. And that's what, that's what the families have for each other. I think the respect bred into love for And that's each other. what a great symbol that is, the joining of the families together. I know Warwick uh, and the family have been working on a Wendell Scott Museum. We're trying to maybe do it in Southside Speedway where he was the track champion. Uh, Southside Speedway is uh, uh, extinct right now but can be brought back to life. Uh, what a great – maybe you should reach out to Warwick. Um, and, and talk to him about it. Cause that is a great story. And I'd never heard that connection. You know, that, that is something that they yeah. treasure and was symbolic to them of, uh, overcoming what was really a lot of obstacles and, and it, you know, and it, and it's always poignant and especially through the Wendell Scott foundation that work chairs and works with kids and STEM and giving kids opportunities to break the cycle of poverty, that education was at the forefront in Wendell Scott's mind for his children. Every single one of them went to college. Most of them were educators. Um, and really showed how perseverance uh, and, and never thinking of yourself in any other way than being, I'm no better than a, any other man, but I'm no worse, uh, can really change lives. And, and he has been just such an inspiration to me. Warwick is one of my great friends who I love dearly. So you ought to talk to him about that, uh, especially. I would love to. I, I, need, I need to call him and talk. I, I, and listen, that is a point, and that is the greatest point when I, when I look at Wendell and look at that family. Um, the educators that have come out of that family and the educated individuals that came out of that family that have made a difference in other people's lives because of the things that they've done. Um, Franklin, I, I mean, he's a phenomenal yeah. man um, and, yeah. and, and, and just a phenomenal indiv individual. And um, it, it, it's so, it, it, that, that part amazed me because I, I look around at, at the other people that raced against him during that time and they didn't send their kids to college. No. Their kids didn't go on to do other things, but Wendell had a focus for his family and a dream for his every family. single Scott member of the Scott family is an inspiration in their own right, in their own way. Yeah. It changed lives in their own way. Yep. Frank basketball coach, mentor, uh, yeah. you're talking work at work. Just, uh, everything is a, is a possibility of making things better for others in his mind. Uh, you're talking about Frank jr. He's a teacher yep. in Richmond, Virginia. Um, I love that family. Mabel, educator forever. Um, just a great family. So thank you uh, for that uh, moment. Remember yeah. that, that meant a lot. And, uh, and you know, I could get the Scots to come to a race if you were driving an open wheel modified for the Sadler Stanley race team. <laughs> Here we go. We could maybe get the truck. Look, I, I'm going to call Rutledge tonight. <laughs> After we get off, I'll call, I'll call his manager, listen, Rutledge. Listen, I'll drive it. I, I'll drive it. I just don't know why you want a 62 year old guy driving your car. I mean, I, I, don't, cool. know. I mean, I understand a 62 year old guy driving you to the racetrack. I can do that. I can show for you, man. I'll get my Uber license. I, I'll do that. I'll drive your car too, though. Don't awesome, worry, man. Done. I've only driven one. Listen, I've only driven one modified in my whole life, whole life. In 1982 or three, three or four, I ran, they, they ran a turkey. They called it Turkey Derby. And they ran at Wall Stadium in New Jersey. And I'm hanging on to the steering wheel. This is a true story. 
I'm, I got the steering wheel and this thing's got more brake than anything I've ever driven in my life. Cause I've never driven anything but cup cars and the ones I got had drum brakes yeah. on the rear. That's how long ago it was. And I'm hanging on the steering wheel and come off turn four at wall stadium. And there's a wreck going in turn one and I hit the brakes. This thing stopped. <laughs> It just stopped. You got running to you from behind. Ray Abraham. <laughs> yeah, Ray Abraham was driving. He hit me yeah. from behind, Hermie. I promise you, he hit me from behind, and he hit me so hard, my hands flew off the steering wheel, and I punched the glass out of the tack. <laughs> punched the, punch, I mean, it broke the glass in the tack. And I grabbed the steering wheel real quick and kept running, and I went and got Ray when it was up. And I didn't even know yeah. Ray. I just knew him, you know, that he did some IROC stuff at the time and, 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 and drove a race car up there. And I said, man, you owe these guys a tack, dude. You hit me so hard, I knocked the tack out of the car. It's not my car. Do you still car. want him to drive, you still want him to drive for us? Oh, yeah. I think he's trying yeah. to talk you out of No, the... no, no, that's great. And, and you asked the question, why would you want a 62-year-old man to drive your open-wheel modified car, the Sadler Stanley race team? And I'm going to answer you in the same way that Hermie Sadler told me that you were coming on this show this week. Because it's Kyle F. and Petty. <laughs> <laughs> That's why hey, we want you to drive. I thought my days were over too. Yeah. And Senator Stanley, you know, we we're of course friends, and and he's a legislator here. But um, and talk, your lawyer. talk to and my lawyer. Well, you were until we. Let me tell you what this guy did. <laughs> this guy's gonna be my friend. So I said, friend. Um, you know, I'm getting older and got kids and working on things. So I invited my attorney and friend to my estate planning meeting with my wife and kids first mistake a couple weeks ago <laughs> to iron out all these things so we can move on with our lives and get everything. Yep. So I would feel better That's about right. things. This friend, once he reads all my documents and my prenup agreements and all that Second gets mistake. up in the middle of the meeting, <laughs> leaves me and goes and sits down beside my wife and says, well, <laughs> I'm representing Angie now. <laughs> I see where the bread and, and the butter are. Yeah, I, that's why I'm the smartest lawyer you know. But he, Bill talked, <laughs> Bill talked me into last year, which was really end up being the beginning of Sadler Stanley Racing. His law firm up at Motor Mile Speedway in Opulaski, um, he yeah. sponsored the, the the modified race, the Smart Tour race that Chris Williams is involved in. He said, "Herman, you got to drive." I said, "Bill, my, my driving days, I just you know." He kept, he's very persuasive as a lawyer and very persuasive as a, as, as you can tell about people that drive the car. So yeah, I agreed to drive the car. Well, you, well, I, I got you drunk that night. Well, yeah. we, when we were talking about it, yeah, not yeah, before yeah. I'd raced. No, 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 yeah. no, 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 no were suffered from getting in and out of the car. I bruised no doubt, every no rib I had on this side of my body. It, you'd have thought Mike Tyson had nine rounds with me, just body blows. Um, <laughs> but it, it did blossom eventually into Saddle Stanley Racing, and we've, we've got uh, three brand-new modifieds, and Ryan Newman drives mm -hmm. for us, and he's won, and then Jonathan Brown won at Franklin County, yep. which is in your backyard. Yep. And at Whitey Taylor's, Taylor's place. place. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. And, and we still yeah. didn't get paid, did and, we? Uh, I don't know. You know <laughs> From there Whitey? was a dispute, actually. I got a call <laughs> at midnight because they were standing at the pay window and they weren't paying. So we had to, you know, I had to use my lawyer hat on that one. But, you know, the funny thing was, uh, and I'll just tell you this, Kyle. So th there's oil on the track. They stopped the whole race for a while. They're this is when I'm racing. Down. Yeah, when yeah. you're racing. Right? When you're at the motor mile and Hermes yeah. in the car. Every other driver, because it's a while, gets out of the car. Hermes not getting out of the damn car. Hermie would not get out of the car. And why wouldn't you get out of the car, Hermie? It wasn't. I, I couldn't get out of the car. <laughs> he said, he said, There's I, no way. I don't think I'll be able to get back in it. I don't think I'll I mean, I'll it's really embarrassing to, to <laughs> you know, try to put something this, you know. A little bit bigger than 15 uh, in, inches. Into a 12 inch. 12 inch Look, I want to ask you real quick. Two more questions. We'll let you go. I want to get your thoughts on racing this year. Who's going to win a championship? But I've, I've realized through this entire podcast that Kyle forgets nothing. He remembers everything dates. You, that could be dangerous for you. We were at a dinner one night <laughs> yeah. for years and years and years. Oh, every Tuesday I did the John boy and Billy show. Um, I come in from the TV or racing and get in. I'd go record on Monday for Tuesday. And so I got to know through the years, Robert D Rayford 
Um, and another thing my friend is trying to get me to do over alcohol is run for Senate of Virginia. We're not going to talk about this on this podcast, but it's a great idea. I yeah. have nothing but great ideas, by the way. Robert D. Rayford, you know, yes. I became friends with him on the John Boy and Billy show. Well, we were at a dinner one night with a bunch of people back when you and I were together at the Speed Channel back in those days. And you tried to tell me a story or uh, some kind of story about Robert D. Rayford being on y'all's uh, charity ride one year. And y'all were delayed leaving the hotel one morning because, quote unquote, they couldn't get him out of the bathtub. Yes. Now, did, yes. Did, did I dream that yeah. up? Nope, you deny it. So here's what happened. So here's what happened. Do you know who Robert, Robert D. Rayford, D. Rayford was? I do. Okay. All right. Okay. So Robert D. Rayford, he, he was coming, he'd go on a ride with us. And Robert was an incredibly smart yeah. man. An incredibly smart man. He was, he was, he was a curmudgeon. Okay. I, on the radio, yes. especially, but he was just a good guy. And so he would ride and he, he'd gotten a little older, you know, and he would do the live, he would do hits from the road for, for John Boy and Billy. So anyhow, we're in golden Colorado. Mm -hmm. I know exactly where we're <laughs> at. And it, and, and here's the deal. Cause we're in golden Colorado because it is the, the next day, the day we're going to leave. It is the, the day for it's the first day that Herschel Walker is going to be on the ride. This this was his first ride that year, um, so that was back in mid maybe late nineties, early two thousands. I don't know somewhere anyhow. So Robert's wife had packed Robert these two containers, these two Tupperware container cylinders. Um, one had. Um, one had like a, a body soak in it. So you just sprinkle a little bit in the, in the tub and, and you sprinkle a little bit in the tub and just soak and it takes the soreness out mm -hmm. of your muscles. And, and we stay at some really nice hotels. Okay. We stay at, it's, a lot of the hotels we stay at are, are like four star. They're, they're, it's nice places. And she packed another one um, with Metamucil <laughs> to, to keep him, to keep him oh, regular. No. Okay. So somewhere... In Robert's travels, by the time we got to the second or third day and we were in Golden, Colorado, Robert was pretty sore, so he put Metamucil in the tub <laughs> instead of putting the soak in the tub. <laughs> well, Metamucil, if you put it in water, it becomes like silicone. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's slick as crap, dude. I mean, you can't move. So Robert's in the tub and can't get out of the tub. <laughs> I thought, you, I, the tub I thought like for it. sure you had made this whole damn story up. No, Robert. Robert can't get out of the tub because hey, do that, do, do that, do that again. How's he getting out of the tub again? What's he doing? <laughs> He's doing. Like, Robert's doing this, trying to get out of the tub. There's water going there. So we're staying at one of those fancy ass hotels where there's a phone in the bathroom. Okay, so Robert finally decides he pulls down some towels from behind him after he's been in the tub forever, <laughs> and he pulls down some towels and. He wets them and he just starts flicking them at the phone across the <laughs> over on the other side of the commode, you know, because he's in this, he's in the tub and he's there. So finally he can't, he's, he can't reach it. So he just wads one up and throws it and it knocks it off the, off the, the receiver. It knocks it off. Well, then it's just a dial tone forever. It's just a dial tone. And he said, he sat there and sat there. And finally, it's like somebody realized something was, the phone was off and they, they broke in. And they, and Robert said he could faintly hear somebody saying, can I help you? And he was like, I'm trapped in the tub. I'm trapped in the tub. So they send, they called Diane Huff, who was running the ride at that time and wanted to know who was in that room. She told him, uh, and they said, well, there's, we're having an issue. And he says he's trapped and she just panicked. Diane just panicked. You know what I mean? So security comes up. They have to break in the door because he's got the thing on the yeah. door and all this stuff. So they have to open the door and saw that off, you know, to, to get oh, in the tub. <laughs> and Robert's just laying in the tub because he can hear him coming now. So he knows he's rescued. <laughs> he knows he's rescued, man. So uh, true story. True story. He was trapped in the tub for like three or four uh, hours. He just he said he kept draining some of, and he would. He said his first thought was drain it and it'll all go out, but it just left that film in the tub, and he was. Well, he's probably in his mid seventies. He couldn't get out of the tub. Um, I just, that, good part where, of the story was he was regular the rest of the trip. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait. Okay, same trip, same trip. I didn't tell you this part. So same trip, same trip. We're coming through Arkansas, and we left the hotel. We're hauling the mail. 
and um and and we get to the gas station and we're gassing up gassing up you know and people come through and you're, you're filling them up and all of a sudden i hear a motorcycle and we, we've already we've been there probably 45 minutes at that time and i hear a motorcycle and i look and it's robert and he pulls right up to the gas pump where i'm standing just and I put the, put the nozzle in and I'm filling him up because that's the way we do it. One person fills up this side and one person. So you put a different person in every pump. So I said, uh, did you oversleep? Nope. I said, well, what happened? He said, Kyle, when you get my age, there's certain things you just got to do when you got to do it. And he said, I'm coming down the road and I got to go. I got to go. And he said, and there's no place. A Robert's got to be 76, 77 now. And he says, I saw an old folks home. And he said, I pulled my motorcycle right up to the front door. I got out. I got my license. I got a card from the radio station. And I said, I'm Robert D. Rayford. You probably heard me on the radio. And if you hadn't, it really don't make any difference. But I need to take a crap somewhere. <laughs> so here's my license. He gave him the here's ID at the door. Here, <laughs> Hold my ID. Here's, here's my license and here's my card. You can call and check on it, but you better point me in the direction of a bathroom. So they sent him down the hall to a bathroom. He went to the bathroom. He came out, got his card and his license, and he came on down and called up with us. True story. True story. True story, man. Robert D. Boy, he was. And he had that voice, too, that He's very distinct guy. sounding uh yeah. voice so look we want to let you go but before we go your just real quick your thoughts uh, on the season you've seen so far uh, yeah. what we really want to do is piss off to social media people so they'll come after you like they always do about what you say <laughs> uh, which i know you enjoy yeah. uh but on, uh, yeah I, I, focus on the cup series uh what, what have you seen so far so many first time winners but uh look in your crystal ball and tell us what we're liable to see by the time we get to phoenix i have no idea Hermie. I, I promise you, I've been around, like, like we started this conversation, I've been around a long, long time. I don't, I don't believe I've ever seen anything like this. Um, you know, I, I think they had 19 winners in 1972, um, which was phenomenal because they only ran 31 races um, and, and at that time, and you didn't have multi-car teams. That's the fascinating mm -hmm. part about that. That was 19 individual teams winning races, or eight, 17 or 18. I think a couple of them were... Or a double up, but when you when you look at that, um, you know that 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 fascinates me. I think two thousand one they might have been nineteen winners, but what fascin is fascinating this year is we've always known that they're good drivers when you get to the cup level. These guys, Chris Busher, Eric Jones, these guys are good drivers. They may not be with a powerhouse Gibbs or a powerhouse Hendrick, but they're good race car drivers. Um, what's fascinating is the amount of of owners and organizations track house you, you got they they win a race you know you've got you know, roush fenway um you know keselowski rfk wins a race petty gms wins a race you know it's like everybody is these people are winning races and the fascinating part and this is why you can't nail down the championship stuff is like if we take the top five from from Bristol and we go to Texas those guys may not run in the top right. 15 that that's that's the fascinating part to me is is you can win a race one week and not even be able to run in the top 20 the next week how does that happen mm -hmm. i've never seen a time when when guys Denny Hamlin was non-existent the first of the year goes to Richmond and wins and then goes back to being non-existent again you know and then he hits his stride the the nine car of Chase Elliott has been in a stride, but they, they didn't show up the first two races of these playoffs. Um, and, and so many people had trouble at Bristol, they ended up second. So does that mean they're back or that so many people had trouble? I don't know. I, I don't, Chris, Chris, um, Christopher Bale seems to be peaking at the right time. And you know, yeah. this is a sport of peaks <clears throat> and valleys. And if you can peak at the right time, then you're pretty good. Where, where has Kyle Larson been this year? You that's, know what I mean? that's been a On big, a consistent big, base. Him and, yeah, him and Harvick more so Kyle because you know uh, yeah. Harvick's got the age yep. and the this and the that, and, but Larson uh, that's yeah. just been a and, mystery. And I and I felt like Harvick was kind of peaking at the right time. If you look at it, Harvick was had won a couple of races. If we go to Darlington, he's running fourth or fifth when he catches on fire. If we go to 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 Kansas uh, out there, he was it was early early in the race, and I felt like he made a mistake. 
by putting himself in a bad place early in the race and, and, and getting in that, that situation. But still, he was a top six or seven car at that point in time in the race. And even at Bristol, he was decent. Mm-hmm. They just took themselves out with a bad pit yeah. stop and they run the top 10. So I felt like, but there's nobody who has said, I'm the guy this year, come chase me, yeah. come get me. You know, in the last few years, we would, we would refer to it as the big three plus who's going to be the fourth right. guy. You know, who are these guys going to be? This year, I, I don't know. I think the car has been a huge plus. I, I think the car has been a huge plus. Single source, you know, suppliers like it or not, and I'm not a big fan of it, but it, I think it has created some, some parity. I don't like parity. Sorry. I, I want to see somebody just kick your butt six ways from mm-hmm. Sunday and then make you work harder to go chase them. I've always wanted to do that. Or, or like that part, but at the same time, I think Saturday night showed some 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 weaknesses of the car. Uh, I think the steering issues. Remember when we used to, uh, you know, the the power steering fluid would uh, cavitate and you get yeah, yeah. and it just mm-hmm. chatter like that. You know, that's kind of what they were describing with the, with the the rack and pinion. It was doing the same thing, you know. And and so there's, I think there's some weak. I think the car is is not as safe as it could be. I think we've heard drivers speak mm-hmm. that, and and especially since the Kurt Busch incident, you look at that and you think, how did that happen? Just backing into the wall. He backs into the wall qualifying. Two hours later, a kid backs in windshield deep into turn one and drives it back into the garage area and gets out and goes home. You know, you know what I mean? With no injury because the old cars crush different. So I think there's some things like that that NASCAR is going to have to keep looking at. But this has been the most bizarre year that I think I have ever experienced either just being around the sport, not, not driving or anything, just being around the sport. Because I think guys show up at the racetrack and they get in the car and they go qualify. If they don't get practice, they just go qualify. And they either know they're going to be good or they know it's going to be a long day tomorrow. And there's no fixing mm-hmm. it either way. Um, and and that's, a, that's a strange place to be. Well, it's going to be exciting all the way down to the end and, and you know people want to complain and talk but i i really think yep. nascar you know just from watching and, and watching on tv and the simple fact to your point that all these one you know winners this year one you know and 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 the the parody and not being i mean it's re- it's bringing people to the racetrack you know people are coming yep. coming back out and so yep. uh, we can complain about things all we want to but if you love nascar racing like I know you and I both do, you want the sport to be healthy, and I think it's healthier now than yep. it has its problems. We've already, you know, but healthier yep. now than it was oh, two yeah. or three years ago, five years ago. Yes, it is. Yeah. Listen, the product on the racetrack is the best product that it's been in a long, right. long time. Right. Um, when you sit down in the stands and you watch it, you actually see people mm-hmm. race. You actually see people pass people, even though these drivers complain they can't pass. You see them drive from 20th up to 5th or 6th. They may not be able to pass those last two, but by God, they, you don't pass those last three or four because they're That's fast. Right. They're good guys, yeah. too. You know, It gets tougher when you get to, to that end. But it is fascinating to watch the product on the racetrack uh, because it is just a, it has been a great product. Well, we'll be watching. Uh, Kyle, I can't thank you enough you know, for taking time. You and your whole family have always been good to my brother and I and our families. I have a ultimate respect for you you've always been fun to work with fun to get to know fun to race with um the saddles love the petty so i can't thank you enough for taking a little bit of time with us uh, this evening thank you so much yeah man love you guys too and li- listen just give me a couple days notice so i can order a new helmet done and, there. and done uh, i gotta get a uniform he, he, fits. i gotta get a i'm just telling you it's around it's no bagging out now you know I mean? it's no bagging out now just, he's gonna go to dinner tonight and tell me. the people we've got kyle f and petty lined up for <laughs> next year sign the papers see that's what it's gonna be do that's, it that's, and, and listen you didn't even have to buy me a drink and that was a really good impression of me too <laughs> but uh thank thank you for for your book uh it's Swerve or Die, Life at My Speed in the First Family of NASCAR Racing by Kyle Petty. Go out and get it. A New York Times bestseller, Amazon bestseller. I got it on Amazon, came right to my door in two days, and I couldn't put it down, I swear. Uh, and it's harder for me and what I do as a lawyer and a politician uh, to read books. And I, my wife leaves me and goes, Shoot, that book must be really good. Well, I took it off her <laughs> nightstand this morning so I could drive up to Richmond and she texted me and said, you took my book just a little while ago. And I said, I'm bringing it back. We were interviewing Kyle Petty. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Dinner Drive on the Circle Network. You got to see it. 
you can get all the episodes on Peacock. It was a wonderful episode that I saw, and I spent the rest of my vacation trying to find it again. Now that I know where it is, I'm going to go watch it all. What a bunch of interesting guests yep. you got there as well. But thank you so much uh, for that and uh, and for agreeing to ride the open wheel modified at the Sandler Stanley Race Team. <laughs> Finally, we got a top tier driver. We, we got him. We got him. Yeah. Thank we you. We got him. Thank Kyle, thank you so much. We we appreciate you. We'll, you we'll get you on again another time soon. Uh, what a what a great interview. Uh, probably the you know I always say you you've got great friends and and everything like that. But the best ever uh, to ever have one of the best people to ever have driven a race car from a great family, a great person, Kyle Petty, uh, and a great book. Guys, yeah. you got to read this book. Even if look, it's not really a racing book. It's a family book, and that's probably what's most important to me. And that's what I got out of it. And so hopefully uh, everybody can get that as well. Well, Senator, this has been another fun one. And uh, Kyle was great. I think we've covered some great issues on the leaning right and turning left moments as well. And uh, I'm going to rank this one right up at the top. I hope I hope our listeners and our viewers enjoy yeah. it. Yeah. And what a great uh, hour. Everybody's yeah. been, been great. Man, been great. thank you for the honor of uh, being able to talk to this guy. One of my heroes will always be. and uh, And – Really just uh, learned so much about him through the book. And tonight we got to have him back on and just talk about maybe y'all's uh, career in broadcasting. Cause that would be an interesting conversation. Well, when he comes to shoot, when he, I'm going to get with him, let him pick a race for next year yeah. to drive we got three our car. Left this, three left in the smart series. This I'm year. Cut your, cut you off right there and say, <laughs> we'll, we'll set up a time for him next year to pick a race and we'll tape a podcast while we're, you know, while we got him at the track. Roger that. Okay. Yeah. Well, what a great podcast. Uh, I hope you've listened to every sing single second and are enjoying it as much as we enjoy bringing it to you. Uh, you can go find us on our Facebook page, the Leaning Right, Turning Left podcast Facebook page. You can find us on the internet, www.sadlerstanleyracing.com. You can get the podcast and find out exactly what's going on with our race team. Uh, when you go to all the platforms, give us a five-star rating. We really appreciate that. And tell your friends about it as well. We're selling merch, Sadler Stanley Racing merch, Jonathan Brown merch. You can find that on our Facebook page as well. Uh, and it's uh, great hoodies, sweatshirts, T-shirts, stickers. We've got it all. So thank you all for listening. Uh, we really appreciate you every day. We've got a growing audience. It's really important to us. Thanks for listening to our message and our fun. And you all have a great and wonderful week. I'm Virginia State Senator Bill Stanley, and I am leaning right. And I'm Hermie Sadler, and I'm turning left. This has been a fun one. Hope you enjoy it, and we'll see you back next week. Can you believe it? It's finally here. It's the most wonderful time of the year, unless you get stressed out about how to pay for it. Savewithconrad.com can help you make this the best Christmas ever. You won't make a house payment for the next two months. That's right. Skip your next two house payments and use all that cash for your extra holiday expenses. And come next year, you're going to have a lower monthly payment. Don't put Christmas on a credit card. Pay your credit card debt off at savewithconrad.com. NMLS number 65084, Equal Housing Lender. Savewithconrad.com.